Okay. Yeah. It's, yes. It's yeah. working. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. So I'm gonna start this also, and then you can. Okay. Okay. So now you you can. Yeah. And okay. Just use this, right? Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks everyone uh, for coming today. Um, so we are very happy uh, here at the CFC Taipei um, to welcome Mark Connolly um, here uh, for his talk uh, between centralizing orthodoxy and local governance, Taiwanese intellectuals, the Chinese revolution, and the search for just integration. So Mark is an assistant professor in the Department of Chinese Literature at National Sun Yat-sen University in Kaohsiung. Uh, his research focuses on modern China and modern and Chinese Taiwanese history and literature. So his writing can be found in journals such as China Information, Modern Chinese uh, Literature and Culture, the International Journal of Taiwan Studies, or um, Modern China. So I, I really want to, to, to thank Mark for coming here uh, today for this lecture. And uh, thank you all for coming here today, uh, both uh, in person and also online. Uh, so I also welcome uh, people uh, online uh, for this lecture. Um, so, so please, Mark. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nathaniel, for uh, this wonderful opportunity to come and share a bit of my research with uh, colleagues here in uh, Taipei. And um, this is a real honor uh, to be here at the uh, Centre d'études français sur la Chine contemporaine. Et je, je peux parler un petit peu de français uh, du Canadien. Alors, j'ai étudié le français pour pendant. 10 ans, mais ça fait vraiment comme 20 ans que j'ai vraiment parlé français. Alors, euh, quand on euh, fait le Q&A euh, de ce <laughs> on peut uh, parler en français, en anglais, on peut. We can do it in all three languages. Um, quand j'entends le français, je peux euh, euh, comprendre. Je peux comprendre comme 60%. So, <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, but of course, we're all very bilingual, trilingual. So it is a real honor to be here. Uh, at the center, and I always actually wanted to kind of um, uh, get to know more about the center because I, of course, uh, very uh, familiar with its journal and with uh, some of the other uh, past directors. So it's really it is a true honor to be here. Um, and so I will just uh, begin my talk today. And very, I thank all of you for coming and everybody online. Um, the title of my talk today is. Taiwanese intellectuals, the Chinese revolution, and the search for a just integration. And um, I want to focus uh, really on the, the question of what a just integration would be uh, or is. Um, of course, in Taiwan, over the last uh, number of years, uh, the government has been discussing and implementing uh, transitional justice, the notion of transitional justice. Uh, but of course, the question is transition to what, uh, transition from what, and how, after you make the transition, how do you integrate once again? So integration can be a question uh, both locally, uh, but of course, regionally as well. So, but before we get to uh, the question of integration, of course, uh, to think about that question, I'm gonna go back in time uh, to a different period of Taiwanese history to think about precisely how uh, Taiwanese intellectuals thought about integration with China at a different moment in time. But before we get there, I wanted to kind of set the stage a bit um, uh, for this talk. Now, what I'm doing today, this talk is actually a mixture of two articles that I've just recently published, all of which talk about uh, the Chinese revolution, how Taiwanese intellectuals understood it. Uh, so I'm going to try to do something very uh, difficult today, which is actually combine two papers. So we'll see if, it, it, uh, if it's successful. Um, but let's first set the scene uh, for where we are today uh, in Taiwan. And I think uh, we can kind of uh, say that what I'm going to say here in the first part of the talk is, is an expression of uh, you know, a certain kind of yo huan yi shi, right? A worrying about the nation that I think anybody who lives and works in Taiwan has to have. And so if we go back to uh, the uh, election of 2020, when Tsai Ing-wen uh, wins re-election, uh, a couple of days after this, she is interviewed by the, the BBC in English. And of course she says uh, this very interesting statement, which is now, uh, you know, quite well known. Um, we don't have a need to declare ourselves an independent state. We are an independent country already. We call ourselves Republic of China, Taiwan. We do have a government, the military, and we have elections. So this notion of Zhonghua Mingguo Taiwan is one could say the key, one of the key discursive features of the Tsai Ing-wen administration. And what's 
quite fascinating is she actually first used this term in 2019 uh, during the national celebrations in 2019. Uh, and this is a uh, English uh, translation of uh, her speech that day. Uh, and before uh, 2019, she did not use this term, Zhonghua Taiwan. Before 2019, she kept within a traditional DPP discourse of Taiwan, Taiwan, Taiwan. It was all Taiwan. But interestingly, uh, in 2019, she's facing re-election. And she, uh, for the first time uh, in this, of course, very important speech, makes this statement, which, of course, she says, in facing every challenge, not only were not defeated, we were made stronger, firmer. We have collectively undergone this journey. And regardless of political persuasion, the people who live on this land cannot be separated in opposition to one another. The Republic of China is not the monopoly of any one single entity, nor can Taiwan be solely occupied by any single entity. The six characters represented by Republic of China Taiwan are not blue, nor are they green, but rather represents the broadest possible social consensus within the entire society. So for this president, uh, this is an act of consensus building. This is an attempt to build some kind of integration across uh, the domestic divisions of Taiwanese society, right? Uh, this Zhonghua Mingguo Taiwan, uh, this Zhonghua Mingguo Taiwan uh, statement. Now, uh, what's crucial to note about this discourse, of course, is, is this is a real uh, change from traditional DPP discourse. Uh, which focuses on the Taiwanese as a distinct people uh, who have, uh, have, through waves of immigration uh, to this island uh, since uh, the 17th century, have uh, formed a distinct local identity, a zhuqi xing, right, a subjectivity. Um, and traditionally, DPP discourse has looked upon uh, the ROC state as a so-called wai lai zheng right, a foreign uh, uh, regime, right? So they've been very loath to really um, want to even use the term Zhonghua Mingguo uh, so as to give it some kind of, um, uh, uh, some kind of validation. Um, uh, so in 2019, she kind of quite suddenly decides that, uh, well, we're not Taiwan, we're actually the Republic of China Taiwan. Uh, and so this was seen, of course, as a kind of olive branch, as a peace offering to the still considerable number of Taiwanese who live on this island, uh, who identify with the ROC as a state, as a Chinese state in exile, or as a Chinese state that reconstituted itself on this island. Uh, but what is interesting about this speech is, and I'll just note in passing, Zhonghua Mingguo Taiwan for Tsai Ing-wen begins in 1945, and really begins in 1949. Uh, she does not, in this speech or elsewhere, ever talk about the Republic of China before 1945. So this, new neologians, this new political category, Zhonghua Mingguo Taiwan, is one that only exists within the currents of Taiwanese history, which is, okay, the state comes to Taiwan fully in 1949, and through a very difficult history, we have learned to uh, live with this, even though it was oppressive, it was, uh, you know, defined by uh, almost 40 years of martial law, but in some ways, the Taiwanese people themselves demanded democracy and made this state be its best self, made this state uh, uh, democratized. So we can accept this. We can accept this. But what is left out of this picture, of course, is any reference to a larger Sino framework. So China still exactly is over there and not part of this discourse. So, and of course, you can't really use the word Republic of China <laughs> without the China, right? Zhonghua Mingguo is a state that was founded in 1911, 1912. It has uh, a long root in late Qing intellectual thought. And so if you're gonna use, if you're gonna identify with the state on some level, you have to deal with the question of its pre-1949 for, uh, form. But uh, so far, Taiwan has not. Now, again, just to set the scene here, in 2022, actually just last month, I'm sure uh, Nathaniel and others you know, are probably very well aware of this, uh, Tsai Ing-wen, very interestingly, um, decided to attend the opening ceremony for uh, the Zheng Jingguo Presidential Library. The uh, Jingguo Tihai Wenghua Yuan Chu is in um, Shilin, I believe. I believe it's in, in Shilin. And uh, this was quite, again, quite surprising, right? And I'm sure if some of you follow Taiwanese politics, uh, this her speech at this event um, produced a real firestorm and uh, uh, produced a lot of division within the DPP and within the uh, Taiwanese nationalist camp. And she said, um, this is a, a news report of what she said. I, I uh, haven't yet found the, the full text of her speech, but um, 
so the news report uh, quotes Tsai Ing-wen as, as what she said uh, uh, during, during, the, uh, during that event. And she quoted Jiang Jingguo. So it was very interesting. So she quoted Jiang Jingguo in a very positive way. And she said, uh, you know, Jiang Jingguo once made this statement. This is Jiang Jingguo's words. So the Republic of China can survive down to today because it is anti-communist. And it's anti-communist in its spiritual core. It is a spiritual baure, which is like a fortress. It's a spiritual fortress against communism. And she said, Tsai Ing-wen said, uh, that Jiang Jingguo had a so he was committed to the protection of Taiwan against the communists, right? And she said that this so this anti-communist pro-Taiwanese stance, this desire to protect Taiwan, is again, she uses the term again, consensus, gongsu, our consensus. And so this is very, very fascinating, right? Uh, in 2019, it's almost as if, okay, I'm gonna take the ROC and bring it into the nativist camp, bring it into the Taiwanese nationalist camp. We can live with this concept. Now we can even take Jiang Jingguo and we can even appropriate him. Now, of course, this is an appropriation, a wild appropriation of Jiang Jingguo because he was of course vehemently anti-Taidu and he, uh, uh, and yes, he was for the protection of Taiwan on the basis that it was the only free part of China. <laughs> it was not on the basis that Taiwan was an independent country on its own. So this is a you know ideological sleight of hand, but it's it's very fascinating, right? That what we're trying to see, what what we're seeing here, is this attempt to fuse Zhonghua Mingguo Taiwan in a way in which it's almost as if ROC becomes absorbed itself into Taiwan. Um, now this. Uh, um, and then, of course, in the rest of her speech, she said, you know, uh, with this common consensus, we have to face challenges, we have to respect each other, uh, we have to move beyond the blue-green divide. And so we can all agree that whether you love the ROC or love Taiwan, it's the same thing. It's essentially the same thing. Now, Taiwan is not alone uh, in, in, in making these uh, pronouncements. But of course, I should add, this really did uh, upset a lot of people. Uh, there were uh, former aides of Tsai Ing-wen, uh, former uh, aides who were quite close with her on Facebook, uh, who you know openly critiqued her. Uh, the famous uh, nativist scholar uh, Chen Fang Ming came to her defense. I mean, this was you know over the Guanyin, you know, it's a real phone bore. Um, but this is kind of, of course, uh, a political uh, a political discourse. But this idea of how do we think the ROC in Taiwan? has received uh, not just uh, attention from politicians, but attention from academics in the island. Uh, and so today I'll share with you uh, what I would say is the academic version of this, okay? A, a more sophisticated, historically nuanced uh, version of this talk. And of course, uh, the most prominent thinker on the island to really try to come up with some consensus between Zhonghua Mingguo and Taiwan is Yang Lu Bing And in 2015, he published this book called uh, in praise of 1949, and in this book, um, I'll first talk about the book. In this book, um, he talked about the meaning of 1949 as being a kind of fusing of ROC and Taiwan. It's very interesting. So this is one of the key passages of his book. Um, 经过一架子水月的锤炼，原来的台湾内涵与中华民国团呃介为一体。一九四九年在台湾，甚至在中国近现代史最关键性的意义，那是中华民国台湾的一体化，是一体化将国家的内涵带进台湾历史的新程中。
exist without uh, the ROC state here because it would have been, uh, you know, um, um, attacked, right? So what's interesting is uh, Yang Lubin talks about this kind of um, mutual completion of subjectivity between ROC and Taiwan, that they, in some ways, they completed each other. Uh, the ROC, of course, was an authoritarian state. The Taiwanese people during the Japanese colonial period had a long tradition of anti-colonial activism, striving for democracy, for self-governance. And in some ways, through decades of activism after 1949, it was the Taiwanese people who saved ROC, right? Who forced the ROC to uh, be its best self, to implement the democratic mandate that was actually written into the ROC constitution itself. But on the other hand, of course, the ROC one party state uh, kept Taiwan out of the PRC. And Yang Lubing also adds, uh, brought all kinds of Chinese intellectuals, Chinese uh, institutions over to Taiwan and really uh, invested Taiwan with a strong sense of Sino-consciousness, a strong responsibility towards Chinese tradition, uh, towards uh, Ty Ty Chinese academic traditions, Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, um, to the idea that there could be some kind of hai wai zhonghua, right? A zhonghua culture, a Sino culture that exists beyond the mainland, that in some ways is more in tune, more sensitive to the Chinese classics, Chinese uh, Confucian values. And so this Sino consciousness was also a gift that the ROC gave to the Taiwanese people. So in some ways they complete each other, right? This is, this, and, and so of course, I'm just giving you a small uh, section of this book, um, but, uh, the basic argument is this, right? Uh, and again, this is uh, Yang Lubing's attempt at trying to find some common ground, right? Between uh, what I'll talk about, why I think uh, this is a, an attempt at finding common ground um, and some of its strengths and some of its weaknesses. Um, now, Yang Lubing is publishing a book in 2022 uh, called Thinking the Republic of China, Si Kao Zhonghua Mingguo. Actually at my home institution in Zhongshan University, we've already had an international conference on this book. Uh, even though it hasn't been published, but the manuscript has been circulating around. I think it's been circulated to so many people, you could probably find it at, at any corner of, of Taiwan. But um, where we invited, you know, uh, scholars from uh, uh, Japan, France, Australia, et cetera, um, to try to think about what does it mean to uh, be part of the ROC today and what does its history uh, mean for us. Anyways, so this is um, this is this is kind of the. I think where we are ideologically uh, today, uh, you have Taiwanese nationalist politicians uh, who have reappropriated the ROC and you have uh, Taiwanese intellectuals who are actively trying to uh, link these two concepts together. Now, um, I'll talk first about what I think are the strengths of this ROC Taiwan formulation. And I should of course add that many people don't accept this and, and it's you know a controversial concept, but um, it effectively tries to fuse uh, two major affective structures, right, that exists in Taiwan. The first structure being a nativist or nationalist vision that understands the Taiwanese people as a discrete ethnic people in their own right, one whose languages, historical experiences, and collective identities are decidedly island-centered, right, rooted in the island itself, refusing to be integrated into the larger overall political category of China and often uh, even the, cult the, the cultural category of China. So that's one affect. Affective vision. And I use the word affect here, not just to mean this is not just a, a discourse or an ideology. This is really about how you feel. It's not just about how you think, it's about how you feel, it's about your identity, it's about who you who and what you identify with. It's in your bone, it's in your spirit, it's in it's in you, it's it's in your in, in every fabric of what makes you. So affect is not a question of just well, we can think this through, right? Logically. Uh, it's really about uh, like, you know, the way that we see every two years in the elections, you know, this incredible performative power of, of, of identity. And the second effective structure, of course, is a pan-Chinese vision, right? Uh, which is grounded in a loyalist vision of deep sympathy with the Republic of China as a Chinese state in exile that provided something different, an alternative to the PRC, right? So, and that also is an emotional and an effective investment, right? If the ROC came to Taiwan in full in 1949, imposed martial law for almost 40 years on the island, it had to mean something. It had to mean something that the state continues to exist today. It can't simply be, as Li Deng Hui famously put it, just a wide-eye junction that you can get rid of. 
right, for people who operate within this affected uh, domain. Um, and of course, uh, there are many scholars who move between these affected domains, right? I mean, at times we can be very <laughs> locally centered, and at times we have a larger uh, Sino perspective. So um, I would argue that Tsai's neologism, this Zhonghua Mingguo Taiwan, represents an attempt at coalition building of an ambitious kind, working between these two effective structures to assert an echo and an echo of the now famous uh, Good Friday Agreement that ended the troubles in Northern Ireland, that one can be Taiwanese, possessing an island-centered political and cultural vision. One can be ROC Chinese, possessing an intense loyalism to the Republic as a Chinese historical project, or you can be both, or you can be both. And so when I read these statements and I first heard the speeches of Tsai Ing-wen and then I read Yang Wubing's book, it actually did make me think of the Good Friday Agreement, the 1998 agreement that ended the troubles in Northern Ireland. Now, again, I want to be clear, I am not you know, saying that uh, uh, the Taiwanese experience and the Northern Irish, Irish experience uh, can be compared in easy fashion. Every historical uh, uh, moment, every uh, country, every society has its own complexities. Uh, its own specificities. But one of the crucial breakthroughs of uh, the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 uh, was that it really did um, try to make room within that society for two identities that were uh, not previously able to coexist. And so what many people don't know is that the first sentence of the Good Friday Agreement, the first sentence of the accord after the, uh, you know, the signatories agreed to the, to the following, the first clause is this. The participants in the agreement recognize the birthright of all the people of Northern Ireland to identify themselves and be accepted as Irish or British or both, as they may so choose, and accordingly confirm that their right to hold both British and Irish citizenship is accepted by both governments. It would not be affected by any future change in the status of Northern Ireland. Very simple language, but absolutely beautifully put. Eloquent, beautiful, you can be Irish, you can be British, as you so choose, and all governments involved will respect this. And this, according to uh, Fenton O'Toole, who's an influential observer of Irish, uh, Northern Irish politics, this was actually the uh, master stroke behind the agreement, aside from all of the uh, discussions of the border, all the frameworks around the uh, uh, political and economic questions, the cultural issue, the issue of identity, the issue of affect. And so I think in Taiwan today, if we say you can be this would be very, a very important. And, I, and it's, in some ways, this is kind of what Tsai Ing-wen is trying to do. Um, and so this is, the, I would say, the strength of this neologism. Now, um, one of uh, the, 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 the things that is done by bringing the ROC back into a Taiwan discourse is that it can serve as some kind of a, um, a way of challenging what you would call um, maybe uh, to use a term extreme nativism or uh, 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 extreme Taiwan nationalism, um, nationalism that tries to sever Taiwan completely from the category of China. And so in Taiwan, we have a now a long uh, history uh, in post-war Taiwanese intellectual discourse of what you would call, you know, and this can, we, we can trace a lineage, right? From uh, Shi Ming, uh, who uh, just passed away a number of years ago, um, who of course, who was uh, famously wrote uh, the Taiwan Ren Sibai Nian Shi, the foreign geary history of the Taiwanese people. He wrote this in exile when he was in Japan, he was in exile from the ROC state um, and he was, virulently anti-ROC, virulently, uh, and we'll see how, what he wrote about um, Taiwanese history in a moment. But uh, Ye Shitao and Chen Fangming were both deeply influenced by Shi Ming. Chen Fangming talks about uh, Shi Ming as his teacher. Uh, he talks about that in his, uh, the biography of Xie Shui Hong that he wrote in 1990, that was published in, I believe, 1992, the early 90s. Um, and of course, Ye Shitao uh, had a, a huge influence on the formation of Taiwanese literature as a field. Uh, if you uh, go down to Kaohsiung, Kaohsiung has a literature museum called uh, the Kaohsiung Wenxue Guan, the Kaohsiung Literature Museum, and Ye Shitao's statue is outside of the museum because him and uh, many nativist writers in the South, uh, 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 of course, um, 
uh, tried to root uh, Taiwanese literature in institutional form. So in the Tainan, we have the Taiwan, the National Liter the uh, Museum of Na Ta National Museum of Taiwan Literature, and Kaohsiung, we have the Kaohsiung uh, uh, Wenxiguan. So there's a intellectual genealogy here, right? And uh, just to give you a sense of, of why uh, I would call this a, um, let's call this resolute nativism. Maybe extreme might be too harsh a word, but certainly very resolute. This is Shi Ming's uh, uh, analysis of the 228 incident. Um, and, and I only have the English here, but we can find the Chinese. Uh, so he says, and by the way, the, the, uh, the, the, the actual publication of uh, Taiwan and Sibanyan is very complicated. It was first written in Japanese and then it was translated in Chinese. It's a very, very complicated text. But Shi Ming says, in the February 28 revolutionary struggle against the mainland Chinese, so the 228 was a struggle against the mainland Chinese. Okay, so it was, he, I mean, he doesn't even try to pretend that there was, you know, uh, that there, you know, I mean, this is a very sensitive question, right? But he basically reads it in ethnic terms. Um, the connections in our consciousness with the Chinese due to common descent were finally broken. Since then, Taiwanese nationalism has been striving for Taiwanese national independence and liberation, defending its national interests and being concerned with the nation's fate and future. The, this coherent set of national ideals at last emerged as the single and highest principle of Taiwanese nationalism. So this is you know, an amazing statement, right? Um, and the mainland Chinese, the term he uses is like So um, clearly reading 228 in, in pretty strong ethnic terms um, and claiming that Taiwanese nationalism has already become a coherent set of ideals and it has emerged out of 228. So 228 severed the connection to China, finally severed those connections, right? And these are connections that existed in our consciousness due to our common descent. But because of the violence of the RSU state, these connections were severed. And we never again had any illusions that we should be incorporated into China or that even that we were Chinese. Now, another nativist thinker uh, who is based in Kaohsiung actually, um, who uh, has done quite a bit to Further, this line of thinking, uh, which would, I would call Taiwanese ethnic nationalism, is uh, Zhang Guihai. And Zhang Guihai is actually a doctor. Um, and so he, he's in a long line of Taiwanese intellectuals, including Jiang Wei Shui Lai, who are physicians as well as uh, 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 intellectuals and writers. And Zhang Guihai just recently, last year, actually had an international conference dedicated to his work in Pingdong. Um, he uh, was at the conference. I was invited to go. And so I actually started to read Zhang Guihai's work. Um, for the conference, but um, uh, he is very, very uh, revered in Kaohsiung. Uh, he was instrumental in, uh, um, Kaohsiung has a big park in an artistic center called uh, Wei Wuying, Wei Wuying Yishu Zhongqing. It's this massive artistic center that was built on the site of an old military barracks. And now it's a, a public park and it's, uh, I think the, they say it's the largest uh, art center in, um, um, uh, Asia, but I'm not sure about that. But uh, the point is, the Wei Wing was supposed to be Kaohsiung's response or Kaohsiung's, um, uh, the equivalent of the National Theater in Taipei, right? So outside the National Library, there's the National Theater. Because again, the idea is that we must equalize cultural, political, and social power between the North and the South. So the South has to have, uh, you know, museums, art centers. So there's massive, massive investments right now in Kaohsiung in all kinds of, uh, of big projects, right? Um, so Let's look a bit at what Zhang Guihai has to say about Taiwanese history. Um, and this is just to say that Taiwan bringing back Zhonghua Mingguo was really a move uh, that runs counter to the intellectual currents of, of Taiwanese nativism. Um, so, of course, the, the major, one of the major arguments of Taiwanese nationalism is that Taiwan is a multiple colonized society. It's been colonized multiple times. And uh, that we are now in a post-colonial period, or we should be building a post-colonial society. So, Taiwan from the 17th century has already experienced for 300 years of settlement history. Taiwan's settlement history and other settlement countries are different. Taiwan was settled by many different kinds of settlement. This can be traced back to Taiwan's Yinling Zhong, the original Yinling culture that was created by the Yinling. This is very interesting, right? Taiwan has been colonized multiple times. It has multiple levels of, of, of uh, colonialism. And it also has this 认同的迷惘, this, this 
confusion about its identity because it has this multi, it's been colonized multiple times and it has this complicated relationship with its place that used to be people used to come from China. So people here are confused about their identity, right? Um, and of course, what is important is to protect Taiwan's this so-called Daoguo, the island nation, right? So, so this is the key reality that all writers in Taiwan have to face. That we need to protect the island nation from a globalizing China. And uh, this is our, 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 the primary reality, the Diga Shensi, right? And where this discourse becomes problematic, of course, is when um, these scholars start to talk about, well, who were the colonizers? Of course, we can agree that Japan was a colonizer, but they actually will say, no, Taiwan has been colonized uh, many, many times. The Qing were a colonizer, and of course, the ROC state was a colonizer. This is Chen Fengming's uh, longstanding assertion. Uh, to my knowledge, he has not changed this assertion. This was a major part of nativist scholarship in the 90s. And I'll just read a bit of uh, how Zhang Guihai articulates this. Because he's talking about Taiwan's post-colonial period, right? So post-colonialism begins after martial law, ends in 1987. But of course, Taiwan's post-colonialism is not complete, as we will hear from Zhang Guihai. Taiwan's Okay, so this is like a very, you know, this is a quite a statement. The colonizers have not left. Taiwan's colonial position is very different than other societies. I'm oh, sorry, Taiwan's post-colonial condition is very different than other societies because the colonizers have not left. I mean, so you can imagine what this discourse means for um, any attempt at building integration, coalition, community in Taiwan. Uh, he's saying that people who identify with China, and of course, uh, there's a important ethnic group in Taiwan who still does that, which is, of course, many of the people who came in 1945 uh, or 1949, uh, that they are the colonizers and that they have not left yet. So this is the kind of stoking of the mainlander versus Taiwanese, the Wai Sheng Ben Sheng distinction that really emerges in the 80s, 90s, and is still, uh, this I believe was written in 2007. Um, so Taiwan Zimin Tong Zi Liu Xia the Zili Jie Go, Rang Cheng Zi Shi Hui the Ti Xi, Tong Guan Liao Xi Tong, Jun Qing Zu Zi Dao, Jiao Yu Wen Hua Ji Go, Duo Su Ren the Si Kao Yu Yi Shi Xing Tai Mao Gai Bian. So the colonial structure in Taiwan can be found not just uh, in pure political power, but of course in the bureaucratic system, in the social system, in the educational system, in the cultural order. So the entire ROC state, from its political and military apparatus, but down to its education and cultural systems were uh, are, are, are remnants of this colonial power and still affect people's minds today. Um, I won't read this entire uh, passage, but of course, when they talk about political, uh, cultural and educational systems being colonial, what they mean is uh, Chinese literature department, right? That Chinese literature, uh, a literature, a educational model that is grounded in the category of China or Sino, Zhonghua, where you would teach students from preaching philosophy all the way to Songming philosophy, right? The entire category of the, of the 25 dynastic histories of China and teach it as a common cultural heritage for students in Taiwan, that this is your heritage, that Mengzi and Kongzi, the, what Yang Lubin would call the Dao Tong, right? The humanist tradition embedded within Chinese history is your history. This was the pre-1987 education, right? It was grounded in this, what could be called a Da Zhonghua Yi Shi or a Zhonghua Yi Shi or a Zheng Tong Orthodox, but this is needs to be overthrown, right? Because what it did, of course, is it refused to talk about, give space to local Taiwanese history and stories. And I do have to say, I mean, I think we all live in Taiwan. We all know that this is true. I mean, we 
when you talk to people of older generations, friends, family, um, you know, they will say, we didn't know about 228. We didn't know about the Japanese phone theory. We had no idea. It was never taught to us. So when Chen Feng speaks about this sense of, of disorientation that his generation had, where they all they learned about was Song Ming Neo-Confucianism or loyalism, right? Or Chinese nationalism. I mean, this, this, the, 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 you know, this is an important point. But here he, what's interesting is he says, of course, the Zhong Wenxi yi jing cheng wei shou hui de fu dan. Uh, Chinese literature departments have already become the burden of Taiwanese society. And they should be, of course, replaced with what? It should just be replaced by Taiwanese literature. So we should just get rid of them all. It should be absorbed into Taiwan. So this on the cultural level is very similar to on the political level. Okay, let's absorb Zhonghua Mingguo and let's um, um, reference only the parts of it that we, we want, right? Um, and just uh, to um, further in, uh, emphasize the point, um, here he, Zhang Weihai talks about the fact that Taiwan literature does not want to be the, the dwarf of China, the Chinese class. So you know, this language is very polemical. Um, and finally, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, Taiwanese nationalism's claims about the past, right? So if the educational system of the ROC was China-centric, uh, and destroyed or refused to recognize or repress Taiwanese identity. Well, then that identity has to be then recovered, right? So in the 80s and 90s, there was this massive explosion, a deserved explosion in Taiwanese history, Taiwanese literature, Taiwanese linguistics, fields that didn't exist in the 50s and 60s and 70s, right? And there was this massive, uh, really the field of Taiwanese literature emerges as an institutional form during this time period. So what's interesting, and I just thought I would give you a, a small little, uh, I guess you could say uh, anecdote or comparison, let's call it a comparison, um, to try to further understand how Taiwanese nationalism makes its claims about the past. So in 2007, um, Zhang Weihai wrote a manifesto. And this manifesto was uh, Taiwan Lin Chuang Jiang Yi. Uh, I would translate it as something like bedside notes regarding the patient of Taiwan, because Zhang Weihai is a, a doctor. Now, Zhang Weihai wrote this manifesto in, uh, to mimic or to, in, uh, uh, to connect with an earlier manifesto that had been written by Zhang Weishui in 1921. So Zhang Weishui in 1921 writes this very famous manifesto, Taiwan Zhen Duan Shu, the Physician's Notes on Taiwan. What's wrong with Taiwan? So they're both uh, in, 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 um, from the perspective of not just what doctors of the, of the body, but doctors of the mind, doctors of culture, they're trying to diagnose Taiwanese society. And Tsang Guihai uh, was very clear that he did this. He wrote this manifesto because he wanted to link the two eras, the era of anti-Japanese colonial resistance among the Taiwanese and our current era. We need to find a link. The Taiwanese consciousness of the past still exists today, and we have a tradition which can be valued and excavated and understood. So there's a trying to be a link between these two uh, eras. I want to create a link between the common subjectivity, cultural subjectivity, the common spirit that animates our nationalism of the, of the 2000s, of the 21st century, and Zhang Weishui's project. So let's look at. Um, the diagnosis that Zhang Guihai produces. This is very interesting, right? In 2007, he goes through, you know, who is the patient? What's their name? Notice how their name is uh, Taiwan Fan Shu. Now, Taiwan Fan Shu, uh, the Taiwan sweet potato is counter distinct between the Yu uh, Zi, the, uh, 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 the um, Yu Tao, right? These are terms for Wai Sheng Ben Sheng. So the patient is Taiwan Ben Sheng, okay? Taiwanese, not mainland. So for the national community of Taiwan does not include mainlanders. Um, and where is the place of origin of this patient? It is from Taiwanese aboriginals, peoples, and so Taiwan Yuan Zhu Ming Yuan Ju Di Yi Ying Ming Ding Ju Di, and the place of settled residence of today's Taiwanese. So any reference to the mainland, again, is thrown aside, right? Again, is, is, is uh, not present. And what's interesting is he calls the Taiwanese uh, a people of New Asia, right? Xin Dong Fang de Yuan Lei. 
and it is a So we have a maritime national culture, a maritime sensibility. So any relation here to China is effectively severed, right? So this really gives you a sense of the ethnic politics of this discourse, right? But he says that he's trying to create a link with Jiang Weishui. So does Jiang Weishui's way of thinking of Taiwan, is it consistent with Zhang Weihai? Is there really a Taiwanese consciousness in 1921? Let's look at what Jiang Weishui, how he diagnosed Taiwan under Japanese colonialism. Okay, so the patient's name is Taiwan, and uh, their Yuanji, their place of origin is Zhongguo Fujian Shan Taiwan Dao. Okay, so it's very clear that their place of origin is China. Their place of residence is Japan, Diguo Taiwan, Zhongguo Fu. So they are now currently living under Japanese occupation, and this is really what gives the ghost away, right? It gives up the argument, which is if you look at their inheritance. Okay, their past, their Yi Chuan, Ming Xian de Juyo Huang Di Zhou Gong Kong Zi Meng Zi Deng Xue Tong. So Jiang Wei Shui clearly identifies the Taiwanese people with Confucius, with Mencius, and of course this is uh, this is classic Taiwan uh, Chinese nationalist discourse. Uh, and their Su Zi, the uh, character of the Taiwanese people, Wei Sheng Su Xian Sheng Hou Yi Su Zi Cheng. Because of the sages of the previous year, because of Confucius, because of Mencius, we have this strong character. We have this strong culture. Okay, so Zhang Weishui was a Chinese nationalist, a cultural nationalist, as well as you might even say an ethnic nationalist. One more or two more pieces of evidence for my assertion. Uh, in 1924, in 1923, Zhang Weishui was arrested along with uh, many others, dozens of others, in what was known as the Zhijing uh, Shijian, the Zhijing incident. And essentially in 1923, uh, the movement for the establishment of a parliament in Taiwan was underway. And it was the Taiwan Yi Hui Shi Zhijing Yuan Yin Dong. And uh, as part of this movement, Jiang Weishui wanted to form a political party in Taiwan, uh, kind of a political organization, basically a political party. And he applied to the Japanese authorities. They said no. And they did it anyway. So they tried, they were in the stages of setting up a political party. And the Japanese responded by arresting over 40 intellectuals across the island. And um, of course, this was a major political event. And uh, by 1924, they were facing charges uh, essentially on uh, Guanfa charges, uh, <laughs> charges against the state, right? Um, and that they were uh, destroying uh, public order and, and, and that this was illegal. and. Uh, and so what's interesting, though, is Zhang Weishui appeared in court. He actually appeared in court. And this was published. This is a big, important event in Taiwan in 1924. Uh, uh, Zhou Wanyao, uh, a Taiwanese uh, historian, uh, I believe, uh, still at Taida, uh, said they were heroes. These uh, participants were, there were people outside the courthouse cheering for them. When they eventually went to prison, people uh, were cheered them to the prison door. And so the Taiwan Ming Bao covered this. They covered this fighting uh, bian lun, a argument within the court, and this is what Zhang Wenshui said when he was before the Japanese magistrate. This is what he said: "Zhonghua Minzu is what? Not a good thing. Is this not a good thing? Why is the Chinese people not a good thing? This is the difference between the Chinese and the Japanese. No one understands that the Chinese is a human rights issue. They cannot be used to make the Chinese the Chinese people are not the Chinese people. 不论怎么暴变自在，做了日本国民，变随即变成日本民族。台湾人明白地是中华民族及汉民族的事，不论什么人都不能否认的事实。国民是对政治上、法律上看来，民族是对血统的、历史的、文化的区别。人种是对体格、颜貌、皮肤区别的，民族中含有相同的。血统关系、历史的精神的意志、文化的共同、宗教的共同、语言习惯的共同、共同的感情等主要素。So he says, yes, we are citizens of Japan, but we are not Japanese people. He clearly states that Taiwan, the Taiwanese people are Chinese, and this Chinese identity 
is rooted in blood, it's rooted in history, it's rooted in culture, it's rooted in a common spirit, it's rooted in religion, it's rooted in language. And so in no way, shape or form would Jiang Wei ever uh, accept Zhang Guihai's uh, linking of a Taiwan only nationalism with his political project. No, I mean, I, I don't see it in the historical documents, right? He was, did not believe that the Taiwan, Taiwanese were their own ethnic people. He clearly put them in a larger category of the Chinese. One final piece of evidence. Um, in 1927, Jiang Wei Shui published Taiwan Shui Wen Ti Gai Zao Huan, his views on how to change Taiwanese society, how to reform Taiwanese society. And he clearly states what his preference is for Taiwan's future. This middle part is from Jiang Wei Shui's article. So he's telling them, Taiwanese people, you don't need to, do not go down a fascist road like the warlords in China, Zhang Zuoli. Do not go down a communist road. There is a third option. And that option is Sun, Sun Zhongshan, Sun Yat-sen. That option is the great broad road of the three people's principles. So, you must get to know, you must recognize the Guomindang is the leader. So I find it mystifying when intellectuals, uh, Taiwanese nationalist intellectuals claim that there is some kind of continuity between Taiwanese nationalism, Taiwanese consciousness of the 90s and 2000s and this era, because the vast majority of Taiwanese intellectuals of this era were Chinese nationalists, right? They clearly thought of Taiwan. Now, that is not to say that today's intellectuals have to think of uh, Taiwan as part of China, but that is to say that the ideological sleight of hand, right? The ideological maneuver of trying to claim that there is somehow a consistent Taiwanese independence movement uh, throughout the 20th century. Uh, at least for me, and I may be, I mean, of course, during Q&A, we can talk about this, at least according to my reading of these documents, uh, it's hard to sustain, it's difficult to sustain. Not, I mean, it's not to suggest Taidu was not talked about, but um, Zhang Wei Shui is not a Taiwanese nationalist. Um, okay, now I would like to move uh, to, so I've talked about the strengths of the ROC, Taiwan formulation. I think it allows us to bring China back into, or some sense of Zhonghua, some sense of Sino, back into current discussions of, of Taiwan. I think it provides an important check against what I would say are the ideological exaggerations of Taiwanese nationalist historians. Um, and it is, it is a, an attempt at coalition building, as I, as I said, uh, um, with reference to the Northern Irish Agreement. I think it has some kind of a similar spirit. I think it does. And I think it is important that uh, whatever happens um, for Taiwan in the future, I mean, we need to have some consensus on the island. I mean, you can't just keep, keep within this ideological whirlpool of blue and green. Um, it is, you know, it, 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 uh, I don't think it's productive. Now, does the IRC form Taiwan, Zhonghua Mingguo Taiwan, are there weaknesses? Are there problems with this formulation? Yes, there are. And so I will talk a little bit about the problems and then I'm gonna use this as a springboard into the second hour of my talk, <laughs> um, which is going to be uh, on about 1947-48 in Hong Kong. But first I wanna talk a little bit about the weaknesses of the ROC formulation, the ROC Taiwan formulation. So um, the first weakness is, and this is mainly the argument I make in uh, this article in uh, Open Cultural Studies, um, which is the discourse around ROC Taiwan is defined by a lack of materialist critique or a lack of any actual uh, reference to political economy, issues of political economy. So uh, questions regarding labor rights, material inequality, climate justice, and regimes of private property remain basically absent from Tsai Ing-wen's discourse. Um, and as much as I respect, and I have deep, deep, deep respect for Yang Lubin, he also has not, I think, really dealt with the question of political economy and how an ROC Taiwan mode of thinking can bring a more just society economically. I mean, I, I would assume most of you live in Taipei, you know, the uh, just, uh, you know, um, egregious prices of homes here, the egregious nature of private property regimes here. Um, and 
Tsai Ing-wen simply does not address these issues. She rarely discusses uh, the economy aside from references to economic development, a kind of singular developmentalism, the GDP growth, the kind of you know, um, mode of thinking that, that, that sees uh, numeric GDP growth as the measure of the success of a government, right? So for example, uh, there was the announcement a couple months ago that Tai Chi Dian is investing in Kaohsiung. Everybody was very happy. But what's so interesting you know, about media discourse in Taiwan is there's no discussion about what would this do for environmental issues in Kaohsiung, which are, are terrible. The winter in Kaohsiung is, 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 is difficult. I mean, Kaohsiung is absolutely beautiful. It's not rainy. Okay? Uh, but it, you know, it, it's amazing to me that uh, the fact that there's such a polluted skies, you know, let's say 20% of the time, 30% of the time is not more, more of a focus for, for public discourse. Um, and um, I think we can say, while Tsai has successfully combined the RRC's old Cold War raison d'etre, Chinese humanism as anti-communism, with the Taiwanese independent movement's desire for global recognition through the nation state form, Taiwan is unfinished national guard. So she has kind of merged these two. What remains absent is any real commitment to a politics of working class empowerment, which is reflected in the Tsai's administration abandonment of progressive labor reform in 2008, the so-called eating show issue or debate, and I can talk about that, uh, as well as her support for Taiwan's increasing integration into the commodity circuits of American capitalism through a liberalization of pork trade announced in 2020, which we just had a referendum on, uh, which now has democratic mandate. But the EDE show was really the egregious one. And I, I mean, I'm amazed uh, that more Taiwanese nationalists who are progressive, who uh, do have some leftist policies, uh, weren't more critical of this. So the EDE show, right, was what it means is it was a labor reform that was designed to provide one day of fixed rest and one day of flexible rest for workers across the island. It was implemented very early in her first administration, 2016, 2017, but it almost immediately gave rise to uh, lots of criticism from uh, Taiwan's uh, so the small and medium enterprises, the backbone of the Taiwanese economy, right? So if you go out to Xinjiang, if you go out to uh, um, uh, Shuling, if you go out to Lingkou, I mean, you just see, you know, it's just small factories all over the place, right? So this was, of course, uh, this was unpopular. And one of the most unpopular measures was that if you wanted a worker to work overtime uh, on a day of rest, you, under the original law, you, if the worker worked one hour, you would need to give the worker four hours of pay. If they worked above four hours, you would need to give them eight hours of pay. So the idea was, if you're gonna make a worker work, you have to give them a full day of pay. So you have to really think if you're a boss, if you need to get them to work, if you want them to work extra. So it was more onerous on capital. Um, Tsai Ing-wen did very poorly, of course, the Mi did very poorly in the 2018 election. This gave rise to the, Hangul, the phenomenon of Han Yu being our mayor in Kaohsiung for a brief period. Um, but, uh, and so in response to this, of course, they amended this labor law. And they amended it in many ways that were quite favorable to capital. But what was really amazing was they not only amended the Yi Shou, they actually amended the basic labor law, right? Um, the Lao uh, Tifa. So they actually amended the, uh, just the, the basic framework uh, governing labor in the island and they did it in favor of capital. So it was almost as if they had to apologize. And so they amended the basic labor law in, uh, in, in various ways of uh, some of which were uh, that a worker under the new amended uh, clause could work 12 straight days without rest. Um, or uh, there, were, there were certain provisions on um, um, how you count pay. I mean, and of course we can get into the details, but the point is this was a big swerve. And I think this was a move away from a, a progressive working class politics. So, um, and this has actually a problem. I don't want to just be critical of Taiwan. This is a problem that the DPP has wrestled with since basically the formation of the party. Cause I was quite fascinated by this question uh, as I was writing this paper. Was there a moment when the DPP really had a strong leftist uh, position or a strong leftist program? And uh, one um, commentator, which of uh, course he's, you know, you have to read secondary literature. Uh, there's an article by David Young called Classing Ethnicity, Class Ethnicity in the Mass Politics of Taiwan's Democratic Transition. And it was precisely about the relationship between class and ethnicity on the island and how it was thought by the DPP. And he says that um, in the early, early days of the Deng Wai, okay, so late 70s, early 80s, there were socialist modes of thinking. There was debate about labor. There was debate about the role of the state and capital. 
uh, there was a pro-labor flavor to the Deng Wai movement. But he says that by 1986, uh, this really dissipates. So I'll just read this and use a political scientist terms. Um, even by the mid 1980s, the opposition's pro-labor flavor was already dissipating. In 1978, seven of the 20 planks in the Deng Wai platform were targeted explicitly at working class concerns. But by 1986, these items had largely disappeared. Even as critics heckled the opposition leadership for their inability to shed their petit bourgeois mindset, leftists and the leftist agenda were steadily forced off the main stage, such that by the 1990s, the DPP were virtually indistinguishable from the KMT on socioeconomic issues. What took their place was an emotional and sometimes strident nationalism, focusing in particular on the promotion of a Taiwanese identity distinct from China and eventual Taiwanese independence. So ethnic nationalism comes to over uh, power, uh, class critique uh, completely, at least according to this uh, political scientist, and such that the DPP are virtually indistinguishable uh, from the KMT. And what, what we see this emotional and strident nationalism, this is really Zhang Guihai's discourse, right? This really is this discourse. I mean, when you say that colonizers have not left, I mean, could you imagine, you know, uh, you know I mean, uh, how, what that means for any kind of attempts to build a coalition, right? Um, so, and then you get the ideological kind of fortresses that people live in uh, here, right? Okay, so that's my first kind of critique. And of course, that's not just a critique of ROC in Taiwan. That's just a challenge to um, thinkers in Taiwan, to uh, government officials in Taiwan. I mean, what does it mean to actually think really clearly about a just and sustainable economy for Taiwan and not just a kind of uh, flattened developmentalism, right? Um, okay, now my second critique, um, or, and th again, and this is, you know, in Chinese, there's a Cheng Yu, right? Pao Zhuan Yu. Okay, so I'm throwing a rock and hopefully we'll get some jade back. Uh, this is next, we're exploring these ideas. So, uh, cause this will be probably the, the most uh, difficult part of the talk or contentious. We're getting into the most contentious areas here now, okay. So as I mentioned before, when Tsai Wen talk, talks about Zhonghua Mingo Taiwan, she's talking about post 49 Zhonghua Mingo. So far, uh, in six years of being president, she has not shown any willingness to speak of Taiwan within a larger Chinese frame, in a Sino-positive, Sino-integrative way. And this, of course, is very different from Mayin Zhou, who essentially would think of the KMT and the Guomindang as you know, two, two brothers who had a fight, and it's, uh, it's within a larger Sino family, and we can figure it out on our own terms, and we don't need America. Uh, we, you know, uh, we, we or, you know, he has a complicated relationship with America, but there's, there's an attempt at thinking the cross straits within a singular framework of Chinese history. And that is a framework that the mainland can accept. We may have differences. We have, this is the 90s, right? We don't, we have different interpretations of history of what is China, but it's all within one cultural, ethnic, political whole. And so we can live with each other. But when you take the Taiwan question out of Chinese history, this is of course the, the major point of contention. So we can say that this Zhonghua Mingguo Taiwan, and by the way, this is Tsai Ing-wen's Zhonghua Mingguo Taiwan. Yang Wubing is a different, uh, uh, he has, uh, on, on the question of China, of course, he has a different position. But uh, I think we can say there is a lack of a Sino-positive and integrative vision for Taiwan in relation to the larger overall political and civilizational structure known as Zhonghua, as the Sino world, which obviously is centrally structured by, in its immediate political form, the People's Republic of China, Zhonghua Riming Gongguo. So I think we need to think about, is there a way to speak across the strait today? Is there a way to think of Taiwan as part of Zhonghua? And if it's not the 92 consensus, which I would not want to defend today, but if it's not that, then we need some new language. And this has not been provided, I would argue, by Taiwanese politicians, and I don't, Maybe Taiwanese intellectuals are working on this. Maybe there, of course, there's so many articles one can only read so much, but I haven't really seen a strong, from a nativist Taiwanese position, a strong attempt at thinking what integration would mean across the straits. Now, integration can mean many forms. The idea of self governance can mean many things. The idea of federalism can mean many things. There are many ways of creatively thinking about what Taiwan and the mainland could be for one another. But so far, I think we are in an era in Taiwan where 
we, the word Zhongguo, the word China is a bad word, right? We do not want to think about any kind of uh, cultural, political, historical relation, right? It's all about Taiwanese identities, Taiwanese subjectivity, the local, the nativist, Taiwanese zhu ti xing, zhu ti xing, zhu ti xing. But of course, there's hundreds of thousands of Taiwanese who live in the mainland. There is a considerable portion of the Taiwanese economy uh, that still exports to the mainland. There are considerable economic links. So you can't simply emphasize Taiwanese nativism without having something to say across the straits, aside from we're an independent country and, 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 and that's it. Because of course, the constitution of this state, the constitution of the ROC is not a constitution <clears throat> for Taiwan alone, right? It's a constitution uh, for the entirety of China. So you still have the constitutional question, right? And um, from what I understand, uh, the DPP is very reticent to make any changes to the constitution. Uh, I remember years, a couple of years ago, three or four years ago, a, um, a diplomat, uh, Canadian uh, diplomat uh, told me, uh, they wouldn't, they, 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 they're, they won't, will, will not do that. Constitutional reform, they've been clearly told by the Americans, by the Chinese, there's a limit and the limit is changing the constitution. So I would be very surprised. I know they have a working group on constitutional reform. We don't hear anything about it. Uh, I don't think, I think it's just, it, it really is too, too difficult. So this brings me to a, another point that I wanna make, which is the Taiwan question can't be solved internally within Taiwan, right? We have democracy, we have elections, we can elect domestic governments, but if it is true that constitutional reform has to be done with the approval of the Americans and the PRC. That would suggest then that the ultimate resolution for Taiwan's constitutional status and Taiwan's future is not ultimately within the confines of this island. It has to, of course, the activism and the wishes of the people of this island have to be expressed and have to be uh, uh, respected, but it ultimately is placed in a structure of domination between the United States and China. So you're going to have to engage with both, right? So, which leads me to the question that I want to think about today. And this idea of integrative justice is one that I'm exploring. I don't have a book yet. I don't have a full uh, theory about this, but I think the key question that we need to think about urgently is what does integrative justice mean for the island of Taiwan in relation to the larger overall Chinese world? What resources do we have for reimagining cross straits relations today? caught as they are in a seemingly unending ideological and effective cycle of exogenous assertion and endogenous reaction. Which brings me to the second part of this talk. So I think I have another hour. So hopefully, bye told, bye told that, yeah. <laughs> um, so this brings me to um, the second major topic that I wanted to talk about today, which is a group of Taiwanese socialists who operated in Hong Kong from 1947 to 1948. Very, very, very interesting. So, um, and I, I turn to this case study because I do think it offers some resources for thinking about integrative justice, but also with the caveat that this is, of course, a different era. So um, uh, this is for reference. This is a tan kao, tan kao um, Xie Xue Hong was, of course, an extremely famous uh, Taiwanese revolutionary and uh, political activist. If you're interested in Xie Xue Hong's life, she has an autobiography called Wu Le Ban Shengzi, uh, which was published in the 1990s. Um, and her, she was the founder of the Taiwanese Communist Party, which was founded in 1928. And she, uh, her close political ally and partner was uh, Yang Ke Huang. And Yang Ke Huang also has a memoir, Wu Le Hui, uh, not the uh, most exciting title, but, um, and, uh, I'll just give a brief background on who Xie Xue Hong was. Now, Xie Xue Hong, uh, there is a famous biography written about Xie Xue Hong by Chen Fang Ming. And Chen Fang Ming worked for many, many years on the biography of Xie Xue Hong. Uh, because as Chen discusses in his biography's introduction, she was almost a legendary figure growing up for him in the 50s and 60s in Taiwan. She was a figure that could not be publicly talked about, but that according to him, everybody knew about and everybody was proud of. So Xie Xue Hong, um, was born in Zhanghua. She had a very, very difficult early upbringing. Uh, she was sold as a child bride into a uh, wealthy family. She escaped. Um, and eventually in uh, 1923, she goes to Shanghai. And 
By 1925, she entered Shanghai Daxue, and Shanghai Daxue at that time was a hotbed of leftist radicalism. Chu Chou Bai was a teacher. Uh, there were many, many famous Chinese Marxists who were teaching at the time. And they see uh, a young woman from Taiwan who, uh, by all accounts, uh, had incredible organizational talents, incredible rhetorical talents, um, who uh, participated in a variety of political movements in Shanghai during those years. And eventually uh, she is sent to Moscow for training by the international uh, in Dongfang Daxue. And she stays in Moscow for three years until 1928. And in 1928, she comes back first to Shanghai, then to Taipei, or then to Taiwan. And she becomes a founding member of the Taiwan Gongtan, the Taiwanese Communist Party. And the Taiwanese Communist Party was founded with the support of both the JCP, the Japanese Communist Party, and the CCP. So it was quite interesting. So at that time, there was this real transnational, uh, these transnational links between Japan, China, China, Taiwan, Moscow. Uh, this was, you know, the, the 20th century history of, of, of international socialism. Um, and uh, of course, uh, the Taiwan Communist Party uh, barely gets off the ground. It operates only for four years. Uh, it was, uh, it did have some early successes in uh, organizing peasants, organizing labor. Xie Xie Hong was sought after uh, for interviews and collaborations with by people like Jiang Wei Shui people like Lin Xiantang, even Lin Xiantang was a Confucian liberal, but he wanted to talk to this person. Uh, she was well known. She uh, at some one point operated a bookstore in Dao, Da Dao Cheng in Taipei. Um, but eventually she, and of course she faces arrest many times, um, but she's arrested uh, in 1931 um, and she is in prison uh, for nine years. She's, so she spends the entirety of the 1930s in prison. Um, and by that time, uh, she, she comes out and she is kind of a, a symbol of, of anti-colonial resistance, a symbol, a folk hero for the Taiwanese people. And what's interesting is Xie Xie Hong comes out of prison and by, uh, in 1939, and then 1944, there's the handover. And you might think for someone who had spent nine years in prison uh, that you would want a less political life or a less activist life, uh, but no, in 1945, she uses the um, uh, relative freedom of the 45, 46, the relative openness, uh, of that period where you could publish newspapers, you could, there was a lot of hope for what Guangfu could mean. Uh, she sets up a variety of political uh, organizations and she begins her activist work once again, very, very interesting. Um, and she was one of the writers of the charter of the Taiwanese Communist Party, which I won't talk about today because I don't have time, but we can talk about that in Q&A. And in the event, during the 228 incident, uh, she took what was described as a martial line, Wu uh, Zhuang de Lu Xian, rather than a conciliatory line, a hui yi lu shen. So after the incident happens and the first couple of days of protests and repression and uh, police action, uh, the island's intellectuals were divided about what to do. Um, and there was a committee called the Er Ba Chu Li Wei Yuan Hui that was set up by the Guomindang uh, or the, the, the government of the island to try to xie tiao, to try to find some kind of de-escalation to try to find some kind of way out of the immediate impasse. Um, and people who, who participated in the, this uh, Wei Yan Hui were included Lin Xiantang, uh, Lian Zhendong, uh, many prominent uh, social figures at that time. Uh, but Xie Xie Hong did not. Amazingly, what she did was she formed the, uh, a, a small military force based in Taizong, and she took over Taizhong for seven days. They rose up in military action against the Guomindang garrison, and they took over the city for seven days. It was called the seven days of self-governance, the seven days of Qi Tian Qi, the seven day uprising. And uh, this is this, I won't read this out, but this is Chen Feng Ming's from his biography, his discussion of the seven days from about uh, 228 uh, to um, uh, about uh, early March, March 4th, March 5th, which was that um, so all organs of government were taken over by citizen soldiers, uh, including the police force, including the military, um, etc. And uh, uh, this, 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 and they had a demand, right? They had all kinds of demands that uh, the Guomindang immediately uh, institute self dem democracy for the island, genuine self governance for the island, uh, and um. They, uh, the Guomindang had effectively lost control of uh, central Taiwan for seven days. What happens, of course, is we all know this history, uh, is that the reinforcements arrive uh, from the mainland and 
Xie Shihong uh, flees with her uh, uh, 部队, with her brigade, uh, to Nanto, to Puri. If you've ever been to Nanto and Puri, there is actually a marker to mark the spot that where her uh, brigade went to battle with Guomindang troops uh, in, 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 in uh, Puri and Nanto. So that's, uh, this is just outside of Puri, and this is the Nanto Xian Erba Jinian Bei. And what's interesting is um, they talk about the battle that took place there, uh, and there's a, a whole, whole uh, a steel, right, for memorializing this. But what's fascinating about the steel, just as another reflection of Taiwanese nationalism, is her Marxist background and the fact that she was fighting for a socialist revolution is completely excised. She's just fighting for the freedom of the Taiwanese people. So uh, they were trying to implement a class revolution. Right? This is, a, this is a, not just a, uh, a political uprising. This was also had a social revolutionary content to it. But this is completely excised from this. Um, so what happens, and this is all in Chen Feming's biography, uh, it is a legendary story, of course. So her brigade is defeated, but she, along with um, Yang Ke Huang and a young uh, brigade member, uh, Zhou Ming, uh, Gu Rei Yun, uh, who's known as Zhou Ming, um, they manage to flee down the island throughout rural communities. Because of course, at the time, the state had, had you know, uh, uh, were, were not, was not uh, de as deeply engaged in, in, in rural areas. Uh, and they eventually make their way to Kaohsiung. And it's from Kaohsiung that they bribe a Guomindang a naval officer uh, and through family connections who knew people uh, from Zoying, they leave and they head to Hong Kong. So they actually flee the island. And there was a, a island-wide warrant out for her arrest. Uh, she was you know, public enemy number one. And uh, she arrives in Hong Kong in late 1947. And true to Xie's spirit, she doesn't retreat. She's not... Uh, 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 totally disheartened, she starts her activism once again. And what do they do is they meet up with uh, other political exiles from Taiwan who had fled after 228, people who had resisted the Guomindang regime. And there's a moment from about 47 to 48 where there's intense discussions in Hong Kong about the Taiwan question, about what to do. And I should add, of course, that Xie Shui Hong, of course, being a Marxist, being a communist, uh, with a background uh, with connections to the CCP, she obviously uh, was in contact with CCP members. Uh, and so these were Taiwanese socialists in Hong Kong trying to think actively about what to do. And so what they do is they publish a journal, very fascinating. So they publish a five issue journal, it's only five issues. And you can find it in Seneca, there's uh, reprints of it. I mean, uh, it was for a long time not available, but uh, it is now. And, um, it was understood, so this journal is called the Xin Taiwan Tongkan, the New Taiwan Series. And it was understood at the outset that the NTS was to be a major forum through which anti Guomindang Taiwanese could assert discursive authority over how the 228 uprising was to be interpreted. So the Guomindang press consistently denounced 228 as Bao Luan, Da right? But, um, uh, uh, but of course, this journal was designed to provide a counter narrative. To, to provide some kind of different reading of 228. So as Zhou Ming put it in his memoirs, one of the major goals of such publishing work was, quote, to announce the leaders of 228 were still alive and to call people to carry forward the great fearless spirit of 228, continuing the struggle to realize democracy and self-governance. So what's amazing about this journal is, and I, do, and I completely um, suggest that everybody go read it, uh, is it enabled the contributors to provide a really thoroughgoing systemic analysis of Taiwanese society, Taiwanese history. And you see within the journal, it touches on issues of the social formation of classes on that, land use, kinship networks, gender relations, even literary and artistic work, precisely the kind of fulsome critique that we need today, quite frankly. Uh, it's a really, um, um, uh, 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 a really wide ranging critique. Uh, and I should add that uh, you may be wondering, you know, how does this journal publish? who funded it, um, there were all kinds of what you could call Sinophone or transnational connections uh, through, uh, through Hong Kong at that time. So um, the journal were, was wired into uh, synetic language communities in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Southeast Asia. So a portion of the journal's original funding was provided by the noted Singaporean businessman and overseas Chinese uh, community leader, uh, Chen Jia Geng, uh, who um, in 1946 founded the influential journal the uh, uh, Nanchao Rupao. Uh, and that, his own journal would also publish articles praising uh, Xie's leadership. So there was 
a global uh, uh, kind of discursive community here or, or, or a transnational discursive community. Um, and of course, uh, journals had to pick sides between the Guomindang and the CCP, right? There was a civil war going on in China. So they were able to tap into these uh, larger networks. Um, and some of the funding came from Thomas Liao, Liao Wen-Yi, who would later go on to, uh, to Japan, who was a famous Taidu activist there, uh, but who of course later came back to Taiwan. Um, and it did sought to reach a reading audience that was both global and local. So copies of each issue were sent to overseas Chinese publishing houses in South Asia, as well as the United States. And uh, the majority were sent back to Taiwan through a variety of open and covert means. So they were trying to actively um, influence uh, the overseas Chinese community as well as Taiwanese readers. One note before I go into uh, the analysis of the journal itself is in Zhou Ming's memoir, he makes this really, really fascinating point, which I think actually deserves more research, uh, that it was very difficult in 1947 in Hong Kong for Taiwanese people to publicly say they were Taiwanese. Uh, to say that they were Taiwanese. So in his uh, article, he talks, or in his memoir, he talks about how the, after they got to Hong Kong, what they wanted to do was to form a Taiwan Native Place Association, right? As many overseas Chinese do, right? So a uh, Hui, a Taiwan Tongxianghui. They also wanted to uh, create a Student Friendship Association, uh, Taiwan Xingyan Shui Sheng Liang Yi Hui. These, you know, common associations that you would create if you were an overseas community, and he makes the point that they were not able to create organizations that openly had the word Taiwan in it. And this is quite interesting. Um, as Gu recalls, uh, this Zhou Ming recalls, uh, the Taiwanese they met with in Hong Kong all felt the need to, uh, all felt deeply the need to establish a native place organization. They also had tremendous concerns, however. The reason being that during the period the Japanese bandits occupied Hong Kong, there were some traitorous jackals and false tigers among the Taiwanese who depended upon Japanese power, wickedly serving evil interests, to the point that Hong Kong people looked upon Taiwanese as being the same as the Japanese traders. As such, after the war, Taiwanese people in Hong Kong were afraid of stirring up opposition. They dared not raise their heads up and real, reveal themse themselves to society. For that reason, the Native Place Organization never got off the ground, and the Youth Friendship Club was aborted at its outset. So we have to remember that this is after almost a decade of Komenka, after the decade of the Huang Minghua movement, and many Taiwanese merchants in uh, Hong Kong, Southeast Asia, in Manchuria, depended upon Japanese power, the Japanese state. Uh, and so, of course, there were deep ethnic tensions. So these ethnic tensions about what does it mean to be Taiwanese? How do you articulate Taiwan? Uh, this is not just from the 90s. This is a, you know, a question that goes far back. OK, so um, a couple of things about the journey. The Taiwan socialists fought for Taiwan's ability to participate in the Chinese revolution because in their analysis, such a movement held out the best hope for the class and gender liberation of the island. So they're very clear in this journal that Taiwan needs to participate in the Chinese revolution. The Kuomintang was a fascist state. It was a militaristic state. It was a state that had just murdered uh, and assaulted thousands of Taiwanese and that, that it was only through participation in the CCP revolution that the liberation of Taiwan could take place. And so there's all kinds of discussions about what the class and gender liberation of the island means. But what's interesting about the journal, and what I think bears a, a reflection, is that even though they had a vision of Taiwan participating in China's revolution, they were not without concern. They were not without what we would call today a Taiwan de Zhuti Xing, a sense of Taiwanese subjectivity, a sense of nativist or localist concern. And their concerns arrayed themselves around three central questions. And these are the questions that I analyzed uh, in my article. Um, one, there was a kind of a lack of Chinese nationalist consciousness, which existed among Taiwanese on the island in 1947. So I won't go too much into this first point, but uh, there are articles in the uh, uh, journal that urge Taiwanese compatriots to participate in, for example, the boycotts of Japanese goods that are going on in the mainland in 1948. But at that point, uh, Taiwan had already uh, resumed trade with Japan. And they urged Taiwanese compatriots, participate in our boycotts, resist the, the, uh, uh, your commercial relations with Japan. Do not engage in trade with Japan. You should, for the motherland, uh, sacrifice your commercial links and uh, stand up uh, uh, to uh, the Japanese, who, of course, they had just finished fighting a war with. Uh, and, they, and they claim there is 
why is there this absence of consciousness? And they talk about that many Taiwanese did not understand the Chinese Revolution. They were cut off for decades, right? Many years. Uh, they did not understand the stakes of what resumption of trade with Japan meant, et cetera. So there is this real concern in the journal that, uh, 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 you know, how do we foster some kind of Chinese consciousness within a, within a society that has just undergone a decade of, uh, you know, Huangming uh, education? Um, two, and this is the point I'll talk about today. Uh, what would the relationship between Wai Sheng and Ben Sheng people be in Taiwan, in a Taiwan that had participated in the Chinese revolution, that was part of a new Chinese socialist state in the wake of the ethnic violence unleashed during 228. So this becomes a real point of concern for the uh, journal. And third, there is also questions in the journal as to whether or not the Taiwanese people were a means. That was a question that was worked through. Okay. Now, in the interest of time, I want to talk about the second major anxiety, uh, because I think this is actually the most interesting part of the journal. So, um, and this is the title of my talk today, uh, Between Centralized and Orthodoxy and Self-Governance. So the third issue of this journal is called, so this is the theme of the third issue. And it's very, very interesting because the journal in the first two issues, as I said, uh, has in some ways a Chinese nationalist uh, position. They urge the Taiwanese to participate in the Chinese revolution. They do it on socialist as well as pan-Chinese grounds. But then in the third issue of the journal, we see it's almost like this whiplash. It's like this ideological whiplash. It's like we're going back towards a nativist position. And the third issue is really one that is spoken or written from a nativist perspective. So you see these different voices in the journal, which I think spoke to the debates in 47 and 48 amongst these exiled Taiwanese. And so there's a very famous article published in this issue called Self-Governance and Orthodoxy. Now, apparently uh, there's a historian um, who, uh, Lin Chonghua, who has worked on this journal as well. She, I believe, teaches at Taipei, uh, Taipei Dashu. Um, she and other uh, uh, scholars have said that uh, the, the writings to be found in this article were actually discussed collectively by the group. Um, and it was put, pen to paper was put by, uh, pen was put to paper by a junior member of the group. But um, this represented a kind of collective discussion. And um, it strikes a nativist note from almost the very beginning. So I'll just read it with you all. The imperious domination of the government has generated social chaos and a complete lack of security among the population. And this chaos and lack of security has only exacerbated the mental suffering of the people. And this, of course, the Taiwanese people. And as such, the people's drive for their own self-governance and survival is felt ever more urgently. Only those who live among the people who are able to place themselves in others' position can appreciate this state of mind. It is a concrete situation which cannot be imagined by those critics who sit on the sidelines and dispassionately look upon the action. So this is a very, very strong nativist statement. Only people who are based in this concrete situation within this community can speak for this community. So clearly they're responding to some of the debates they're having uh, with potentially mainland uh, uh, CCP members, what have you. Um, and it, for the first time in the journal, tells us what self-governance is for Taiwan. Because remember, they're imagining Taiwan as part of China, but they're also imagining Taiwan with Zizi, okay? So what does self-governance mean? During the 228 incident, when what has come to be known as the seven days of self-governance was implemented, which is Xie Hong's seven days of rule, the Taiwanese people came to have an initial faith in Taiwan's own ability to govern itself. For these seven days not only revealed the emptiness and smokescreen-like nature of local self-governance during the Japanese period, but a new condition of hope was pushed into existence out of the two years of darkness that had characterized Taiwan since retrocession came to the island. As such, the ability to analyze and distinguish between false self-governance and true self-governance has become far easier. And what does this self-governance mean? It means democratic elections. It means that the uh, Taiwanese island is ruled by Taiwanese themselves. And what's very interesting is for the first time in the journal, we see the question of why Sheng and Ben Sheng. And it claims that only Ben Sheng can rule Taiwan. Why Sheng people, cannot be the rulers of Taiwan. They uh, only, well, we'll put it this way. 
Only through democratic elections amongst local people can a leader, a governor for this region or for this province be determined. So in this very interesting uh, part of this article, it says, indeed, genuine self-governance for Taiwan brings with it to a certain degree, a certain independent, duli xing, an exclusionary, pai wai xing, nature. Regarding these two qualities, they are cursed by wai sheng officials whose positions are half gained by hereditary inheritance, cursed by those with familial connections to said bureaucratics, and cursed by the general population of wai sheng people who treat Taiwanese in a discriminatory manner. This is unavoidable. This is the hatred that self-interested parties have towards the common good. You cannot enlighten these people. The benefits of true self-governance rest with the Taiwanese masses, while the benefits of bureaucratic false governance will be enjoyed only by the ruling class who pretend to practice democracy. So it's very, very fascinating. I mean, this is as about as close to Taidu thought as you can get without saying Taiwan is a nation. It still maintains that Taiwan has to participate in the Chinese revolution. Taiwan will ultimately be part of any socialist state, but Taiwan must have a certain duli xing and a certain pai wai xing. And this is represented, of course, through uh, the fact that Taiwan does have these profound ethnic differences that so-called Bensheng Taiwanese, because they had undergone the process of 45 years of colonial rule, because they had already generated a sense, a desire for self-governance on their own, that they were pai wai that they would be doing, that they would assert this. And yet, this is all within a Chinese federation. This is all within a Chinese federation. Um, and this talks about, of course, that this self-governance will not be just for Taiwan, but every province in China should have a governor that is democratically elected, not one that is appointed by a central government. Um, and if you don't have this, then it will be the Taiwanese masses or the, any local population will suffer because they won't have actual political power in their hands. Um, and of course, it imagines this federal China and they use the term Lemba, Zhonghua de Lemba. The pursuit, uh, when the gen, genuine self-governance is established in every province in China, with the political status among the people of each province equal, no one will discriminate against others or be discriminated against. So this is a vision of a federated China uh, where uh, the central government cannot appoint local rulers, right? Local rulers must be elected through the, the population, local populations. And so this is how they try to balance what it would mean for Taiwan to be integrated within a socialist China, but to maintain power amongst local people, right? And uh, this was their, you know, fang ai, right? We would have democracy, we would have lo power locally, in the hands of local people. And yet somehow we would still be part of a larger federation. Now I'll finish on this. That was the zizi part. What was the zheng tong? What was the zheng tong? Why would they use this term zheng tong? Very interesting is, and this is why this article is, is just so fascinating, is they, in another uh, paragraph in the article, uh, the article talks about how the desire for the, Zhongyang Zhengfu, to control the provinces, to control local communities, is not one that is just a problem for the Guomindang. This is not just the Guomindang who does this. They say, there's a part in this uh, article that says, certain members of the progressive opposition, they also have this orthodox position. This is clearly referring to CCP members who believe that the CCP should rule Taiwan from Beijing. They say even amongst the progressive circles, our allies, they have this orthodoxy. And they define this Zheng Tong as endemic within Chinese political thought, too cool. As part and parcel of Chinese political thought, a tian xia yi shi, right? A tian xia vision for thousands of years. So it's very interesting. This is how they define what Chinese orthodoxy is. This notion of orthodoxy has not changed in a thousand years. This concept, which, with, which emerged within feudal consciousness, is a venom that has at every turn blocked China's political reform. This is an element that exists at the level of consciousness and to various degrees is ensconced within the minds of Chinese people, emerging at various intervals to exude its power. The position that this orthodox vision takes towards Taiwan is China must control Taiwan. But differently, Taiwan must accept China's rule. 
Since retrocession, the bureaucratic government has employed this mindset to rule Taiwan. Bureaucrats have ruled Taiwan as if, as if it were just like any other province. The result of this is that not within 500 days of their rule, they encountered the counterblow of the 228 movement. As a result, these bureaucrats have no recourse but to amplify their terror tactics in order to clamp down upon the Taiwanese mass. This sentence, this paragraph, we can think about 1947, we can think about 2020 Hong Kong, we can think about many different places. But this is a charge not against the Kuomintang, not even just against the city, against Chinese political thought as a whole. And there's a very famous line um, here where the same article says, they make explicit, we're not just critiquing the Kuomintang. This is a challenge to the CCP. You cannot rule Taiwan from Beijing. The article says, when the reactionary clique falls, who comes next? Will it be the case of simply the Kuomintang going and then the CCP coming? Chiang departs and Mao arrives. Once the reactionary Kuomintang collapses, will it simply become the Tianxia of the CCP? So, I mean, this is you know, amazing that in 1947, this article was published. Clearly, Xie Shihong Yang Kuofang had this incredible kind of uh, uh, concern, right, about integration. And yet they also assumed, they're not assumed, they also argued that integration was the only way to achieve a just uh, Taiwan. And, and, and they talk about justice in economic terms and in gender terms. Um, and finally, if we're searching for um, the root of Taiwanese nationalism or the origin, I would suggest it's actually not found in Jiang Wei Shui. It's not really found in the, in the colonial period because they really did have a Sinode consciousness. I think it really is found in 1947-48 to some degree. Uh, for example, in this same article, they talk about what has emerged after 228 in Taiwan is the Kuomintang. This regime is looked upon as a controlling suzerain state with its bureaucrats and those Halian from other provinces looked upon as people of a foreign nation. The government's bureaucratic greed and corruption has generated within the Taiwanese people a form of resistance grounded in a sense of Taiwanese themselves being a distinct ethnic national group. So what the violence of 228 did was to make the Taiwanese people look at the Kuomintang as a controlling foreign nation. So this is quite interesting. And now returning to Shi Ming, there, there may be something to what Shi Ming says, right? Um, so what does this mean for how do we think today? How do we think today? I can't tell you that the ideas in this journal would um, offer a complete roadmap to solving the cross straits uh, issues. Um, but what I think history can, do, can does, what I think what it means to go back and try to read these documents is it can show us the complexity, the range of positions that people took in relation to this question. It is not the case that Taiwan and a socialist China could not be integrated or could never be integrated. There were ways of actively thinking about this, but also ways of thinking about how to, to maintain Taiwanese democracy, Taiwanese local self-governance, Taiwanese rights and freedoms. And the full range of those positions were explored in this uh, 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 journal. Um, and so, is it a resource for thought today? I don't know, but it is, I think, a very, very important historical attempt at thinking about what a democratic, self-governing, socialist Taiwan would have been in the two two in in in, in a post two two eight period where they did believe actually that the Kuomintang was going to fall almost immediately. Finally, you may think that this vision was acceptable to the CCP. It was not. <laughs> um, I will go here. In 19, July of 1948, after the five issues of this journal is published, there is what is called the Hong Kong Conference, Shenggang Hui Yi, and Chen Fanming, Lin Chonghua talks about this conference. So essentially, this conference was Yang Ku Huang, Xie Shi Hong, and members of the CCP uh, meet in Hong Kong. And they discuss what would be the line going forward. And I should add that it was at this time, 4748, that Xie Shi Hong establishes a political organization called the Taiwan Min Zhu Zi Zi Tongmeng. Called the, today we call it the Taimeng, the Taiwanese Alliance for Democracy and Self Government. The Taimeng still exists today in Beijing. After 1949, of course, Xie Shi Hong could not return to Taiwan. She left Hong Kong uh, after um, 
uh, actually just on the eve of liberation. And she, uh, her and Yang Kuhuang, uh moved to the mainland, lived in Beijing for many, many years. Uh, and they essentially became leaders or they were the leaders of the Taimong. And this was an organization that was supposed to work towards some kind of democratic self-governance within a confederated China. And today, the Taimong is still one of the official, <clears throat> official democratic opposition parties in the CCP. It's the eighth largest um, party, uh, opposition party in, in the, in the uh, CCP Congress. Uh, it still exists, it has a headquarters in Beijing. Uh, interestingly, the leaders of the Taimong today are the offspring of this generation. So it's Xie Shihong, Yang Kuhuang, and many others, Taiwanese socialists who made their way to the mainland uh, and who could not return to Taiwan. Of course, they settled in China, right? And they had children. And um, the leader of uh, the Taimong today is, 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 is a child, is a descendant of these um, Taiwanese, but they've never been, you know, I, I don't know if they've ever come back to Taiwan now, but uh, they were born in the mainland. So the Taimong still exists today. Um, however, so this Hong Kong conference was designed to set an official line for what the Taimung would, would, would espouse. And in the final resolution of the conference, we have this uh, statement. And this is a statement that apparently Taimung members and the CCP agreed to. But we'll read it because this reads like, you know, the CCP taking Xie Shui Hong to task for these ideas. This is from the conference resolution. Some Taiwanese opportunists have proposed the notion of Taiwanese independence, and some progressive people have also opposed the note. Uh, have also proposed the notion that in the future China will be a confederation under the banner of new democracy. Both of these notions betray the interests of the Taiwanese people. For if the Taiwanese people want to achieve genuine liberation, they must stand together with the Chinese people to separate and alienate the Taiwanese people from those of the interior of the country. Nay, deep will cause great damage to the struggle. Cadres of the TCP, Taiwanese Communist Party, should recognize that in the past, under Japanese rule, they had no communication with the CCP. And as such, they are unfamiliar with the correct line that is developed from the party under Mao Zedong's leadership. They should study with humility and should not insist on keeping their old views. So this window in 1947-48, this brief, brief time period, where the official line of the CCP was new democracy, and they were trying to get opposition parties to support their side of the civil war. This brief, brief time where it was possible to think about a confederated China gets, gets crushed basically uh, even before liberation. And what happens to Xie Shihong and Yang Kuhuang after they leave for the mainland? I'll, I will just read from the final uh, couple of paragraphs from my article. And then I think I've spoken for about 90 minutes. So I think we can uh, take some Q and A, but I'll just read uh, from the, uh, article, um, just to summarize, uh, what happened to Xie Shui Hong. By early 1949, the Taimong members headed to Beijing and Xie was given a prominent place within the new bureaucracy, serving as a delegate at the First People's Consultative Congress, which worked to draft a constitution for the new PRC state. Yet conflict between the Taiwanese exiles and central party authorities broke out almost immediately after their relocation to the mainland. In May of 1950, as part of a planned but never implemented military assault on Taiwan, the CCP decided that the, during the ensuing occupation, Su Yu, then second in command of the Eastern China Field Army, would become the provincial secretary of Taiwan, with Xie Shui Hong and Tsai Xiaotian serving as vice secretary. Xie Shui Hong strenuously opposed this, reportedly pounding a table during a meeting with the secretary of the Eastern Command, Rao Shu Shi, vigorously asserting that only a democratic vote taken within the island could decide the question of who would serve as Taiwan's provincial secretary through the democratic measures outlined in the new Taiwan series a year prior. Both Yang and Xie would be persecuted in the rectification campaign of 1952, critiqued for rightist deviations in their thought, which were summarized in four charges made against them, that they advocated a high level of autonomy for Taiwan. Two, that their leadership style was marred by paternalism. Three, they indulged in hero individualism. And four, they insisted that among the Taiwanese, there were no traitors to the nation a position of tolerance for Taiwanese collaboration with the Japanese during the colonial period. By 1954, relations had become so fraught between Yang and Xie and the party that Yang Kehuang submitted to the central party leadership a document titled, Taiwan is another nation, Taiwan Wei Ling Yi Min Zhu. And I have not read that document. I, I can't find it. I, if you have it, please give it to me, but I can't find it. Uh, I mean, Taiwan. Persecution would continue during the anti-rightist campaign of 1957, 
and later during the Cultural Revolution with both Young and Shea subject to physical and mental violence, which contributed to Shea's worsening health, worsening health and eventual death in 1971. Denounced as rightists in the mainland and as leftist bandits in Taiwan, Yang and Xie died veritably stateless without being accepted by any single political regime on either side of the Taiwan Strait. Even today, Xie Shui Hong is a problematic figure for the Taiwanese nationalism of the governing Democratic Progressive Party, DPP, precisely because of her close relationship to the PRC state and committed socialist values. That the CCP could not endorse a political project organized around the Taiwanese as a self-governing people, even within a larger Chinese confederation, has had lasting repercussions for political thought across the Taiwan Strait, down to this day. While we should not naively believe that revisiting this tumultuous time period can unlock cross-strait relations today, after 70 years of largely, of largely differing developmental pathways, it is harder than ever to imagine a union of the CCP's new Tianxia with the exacting commitment to Taiwanese independence of the DPP. At the very least, the political thought, thought to be found in the new Taiwan series should alert us to the full complexity of the positions that Taiwanese socialists took during this time period. They speak to a complexity of perspective that both the CCP and Kuomintang found it easier to silence than to confront. As a result, the NTS New Taiwan series prediction of a bad infinity from which cross-strait relations would never recover from has seemingly come to pass. The securitist deadlock of mainland orthodoxy versus island resistance seems more potent today than ever before. And I'll just end it at that. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for, for this. Uh, I think we will uh, have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, so we will we'll begin uh, with the presentation uh, for the, the audience, of course. And uh, I'll, I'll also check the, the commentaries on the YouTube videos if there are any. Uh, questions. Um, so, questions. Um, now, we have any. Um, I, will, I, will, I will ask the questions uh, first. Um, so, so first, thank you for your talk. It was uh, very interesting and you have a lot of thoughts for uh, everyone, I think. Um, my, my, my question with regard because. Um, we're talking about the, the different position about uh, Taiwan, so the nativist position and the pan Chinese position, but also the socialist position uh, in the in the twenties and afterward in the forties. And um, I think that something missing is the position of the Taiwan indigenous people yeah. um, that are not present in this uh, kind of opposition. And if in the nativist position there are some use of indigenous uh, 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 yeah. mm -hmm. uh, it's mostly a utilitarian uh, use of uh, mm -hmm. indigenous people. Um, so, can we think uh, about another position, maybe, uh, that will uh, give voice to these people? That sometimes we feel that they don't have any voice in this kind of position uh, because they are used, but they are not heard. Mm -hmm. So, that's uh, one question. Maybe I will have another question that, yeah. that will be. Thank you. Great question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you want to take another question? Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for, for your for, for the presentation. I think I have like, more remarks than, than questions, <laughs> uh, which tends to be, to be more uh, challenging. Really. But like you say, like this uh, Republic of China, Taiwan, like is it really a neology? Of Taiwan, because I think uh, for me, like it's something like this formula is it's from the early 90s, maybe time way actually yeah. started to talk about this republic, this hybrid identity, you know, like this kind of like uh, two in one yeah. formula, and even Chantrivian actually sort of symbolically follow it at least during this first term. Yeah. Mainji also play with that uh, hybrid. And the, the, the fact that it's not defined allow a lot of manipulation. And sometimes it's more from Amigo than Taiwan, and sometimes it's more Taiwan than Amigo. Yeah. So yeah. Is it really a neurologist? I, 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 I would, why, 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 why do you use the word neurologist, actually? Yeah. For me, it's not. Yeah. And, um, 
And uh, yes, so that's uh, uh, like size positions, even if she did not before 2019 use that term, she was always in her like uh, um, presidential speech, like uh, during the national day and her inauguration, she always introduced herself also as the president of John Farming War. So right. actually, Tsai is quite of, uh, of uh, non like a light green, perhaps, if I may. Right. <laughs> uh, on the spectrum, and but that's quite consistent. And then what's new, that's, that's actually true, uh, what she is doing with uh, the, the symbol that is uh, Changjingo is, uh, of course, new. That's that's that, that, that's uh, we say that's more interesting, especially in terms of uh, transitional justice and how it may contradict her own agenda of transitional justice in some some way. Um, about uh, that's my first, uh, perhaps the main and most interesting question. Um, the the second. Point maybe on the bar. Uh, I don't think that actually, like the, the way the way, like you, you kind of suggest that Xie uh, Shui Hong has a strong influence in Taichung, especially, and even on the leadership of the uh, of the, the 20, on the on the uh, Shi and even in Taichung, actually, the communists try to be the most influential elements, but they were not to divide, but we point out that they were divided between different tendencies, not just in Taichung, but everywhere in Taiwan and Urba. There is not one Urba, but many Urba. And, um, and it's true that you had fights in uh, in Zhanghua, in Jiayi, so in central, so in southern central Taiwan. But uh, you have other works because perhaps Chen Tongling is not the best source on, on the Urba. Uh, you have other works uh, who um, uh, have thousands of uh, yeah, yeah. literary uh, works on the Urba. And uh, in, in, the, in Taichung, the, the, the communists tried to play a role and they did have an influence, but they were not controlling the, yeah. the whole city. And I think that this, 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 this depiction of Xie Shui Hong and even of the communists within Urba might just give them a way stronger role than what they actually had. And that perhaps also that's also like the view that uh, that is now in the mainland because in the mainland they had even built like a few years ago the monuments to remember like the pro the revolutionary marches of Urban, which actually were not uh, revolutionary and actually that was just a really like even that was not the main that was I would say it's a kind of like sideline tendency within uh, within Urban and. Um, you cannot, they were not, the Rashid Shibudu was certainly not kind of revolutionary, like you may know. Uh, I think about the work of Victor Rousseau in French and mm. how he described how actually they were uh, mobilizing, uh, singing, like wearing Japanese uniforms, singing yeah. Japanese mm. military song, and even using Japanese weapons. Not because they were pro Japanese, but that's how they learned. How to do war? Many of them were even people who have been joined, the, who were mobilized by the Japanese at the end of the era. But you cannot say that they were like. It doesn't mean that they were pro-Japanese or that they were even pro-Taiwan independence. Taiwan independence came actually after. There was not yeah. something formulated within the events. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm kind of not really sharing that that that, that part of your um, intervention on the agency and the influence and. I, I, there, there is also like a, a PhD in French that was uh, many years ago in France. Uh, there mm -hmm. was a Taiwanese, I forgot her name, and she did a PhD in France on Xie Shui Hong. Mm -hmm. And she kind of like deconstructed the myth yeah. that she was actually not as uh, successful as a, as, a, as a career and mm -hmm. not as the, the, the leadership might actually like not this kind of uh, ideal typical description mm. um, of this guy. Kind of, of this guy, kind of, uh, she was certainly, and uh, the, her life is remarkable. That's true, but perhaps not as successful as a, as a leader uh, for uh, many reasons. Um, and last, uh, yeah, so maybe the the, the other part, I uh, have to say, I uh, have to be good. Um, that we can talk about that. Uh, maybe last is like it's it's kind of a really strong claim 
uh, to say that Taiwanese nationalism doesn't start during the colonial era by following mm -hmm. the understanding of that start with the uh, bar. Mm -hmm. so it's a really, really strong claim. And like, uh, you, you are going against that uh, a lot, so mm -hmm. even the, the Tai Shu mm -hmm. and and uh, and uh, and even even things like um Chen uh Hong Kong, right? Mm -hmm. uh, wrote biography of uh uh and the first one was more putting him with the with the Taiwanese nationalism. The second one uh, was more putting him with Sun Yat-sen and so forth, so on. And that's why and then Hong Kong Chong started to work with and switch it from the Chen administration to the Ma administration. So that actually kind of like because <laughs> yeah. then he was in the control UN uh, during my intro, and then he went to the Chinese National Justice Commission and that created a lot of mess. Um, so yeah, that's 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 uh, that's kind of challenging because perhaps um, China, like Zhongguo, Zhongguo, and also Russia, Zhongguo, and whatever, uh, just means should be recontextualized a lot. What is China, especially like this dialectical relation with Taiwan and China, and, and the, 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 this this China things should things sorry. China, I don't know, concepts, uh, country, or like the cultural, all this part should be like totally uh, recontextualized. And perhaps for Chen Wen Shi, it will mean a totally different thing before and after the uh, and, uh, and, uh, and and Chen Wen Shi was not advocating unification with the, uh, I don't think, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that he was, he wanted to be, uh, mm -hmm. to put Taiwan as a uh, Tong Famigo, or the forest of Tong Famigo, mm -hmm. where it was perhaps just. Also, way to because uh, it was the twenties, so it was still like those new ideas and nationalism, and, and just look at China, but actually talking about Taiwan, mm -hmm. and without the Yuan to part, the Yuan Jumin to become the useful uh, independence token, but quite to this end, that's true. Right. And we, yeah, and uh, that's the yeah, three remarks and integrative justice where we can talk about that. So uh, <laughs> later, because the problem is the other side doesn't really want to, if you can, yeah. in, in, in this non-egalitarian relationship between uh, China and Taiwan, and that's really interesting at the end for mutual rectification. Like yeah. as soon as this, started, as soon as it, yeah, autonomy was bam, yeah, yeah, and uh, that's the problem even today. Yeah. So you cannot really have a justice if it's a, a, a difference of weight between the two partners and. Yeah. It's kind of because um, you do have you still have some people who um, the, 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 there, are, there are still some leftish pro unification Marxist organization in Taiwan. Yeah, there are still very small, of course. Yeah, uh, one of them is the former political prisoner. They still have this little commemoration of the year, um, and they are they are perhaps the closest uh, from. Um, uh, today they are perhaps the, the real, the real, I don't know, the, the closest to this kind of idea because yeah. they, they also want, I always have a hard time to understand because they want unification slash autonomy, mm. which sometimes is a bit, which especially the Taiwanese discourse is a bit of, uh, usually if you want autonomy, what I do, but now they hate the Taiwanese yeah. words, and then they want unification, but no. Yeah. Just, which is which is the same problem. And, and they are not Jongma because also like you can be for China, but then you can go like super Jongma Mingo. Yeah. Right. Right. So like, again, this idea of being Chinese doesn't mean the same thing. Yeah. So um, and for them, so for them, they are not like pro ROC, but they are still of the mix of it's kind of a, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for those great comments. Should I, why don't I respond to the two sets of questions, then we can. Um, so uh, thank you very much to uh, for those uh, two sets of uh, really important comments and questions. Nathaniel, and uh, this is our first time meeting each other. This is great. Uh, I, I, you're a, a professor? Or, no, uh, uh, I am. Uh... <laughs> No, I'm a visiting fellow. I'm still here. Oh, okay. great. Uh, but uh, I, 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 was, I had the postdoc, but it just finished. Oh, okay. And what, what's in? Uh, Vladimir. Vladimir. Okay. Thank you, Vladimir and uh, Nathaniel. Great questions. Uh, for the first question um, from Nathaniel on the uh, Taiwanese, the role of the Taiwanese indigenous people within this uh, history, 
Um, you're absolutely, absolutely right. Uh, the uh, today's talk of, and uh, the um, new Taiwan series as a whole uh, simply really very rarely touches on even the presence of Taiwanese indigenous people. During 228, uh, in the memoirs of uh, Shei Shou Hong and, uh, or uh, sorry, uh, Yang Ke Huang and Zhou Ming, um, they do mention that there were indigenous uh, members of her brigade, right? So they do, they do point out, they go to lengths to point this out. But as you put it uh, very, I think, clearly, this is a very utilitarian, you know, appropriation, right? This is to say, well, you know, this was uh, not just a Han Chinese uh, movement, that there were uh, uh, Aboriginal um, allies. Uh, but no, I think you can um, fairly say that uh, for uh, the rhetoric that we find in the NTS, um, they did not have a very strong consciousness of, of, of those, um, that, that if you look at Taiwanese history from an indigenous perspective, it is very different. Um, it is, it is, you're absolutely right. It is a different position. Um, and um, that is a great question uh, that we need to continue to uh, think about. And I look forward to talking with uh, both of you after the talk. Um, how do we think Urba from an indigenous perspective? What kind of research do we have? What kind of works are being done uh, through whether it's historical, archival, uh, oral uh, uh, history? Uh, but no, they uh, just bluntly, they're, they're really not part. Uh, so that's really interesting too, when you think about integration, right? That their vision of this, of this question, of this problematic, right, is one that already has an absence there. Um, so that's, that's a great point. Um, to Vladimir's uh, three points, um, thank you, thank you very much for those three great uh, and compelling uh, uh, points and interventions. Uh, and I think it's, I love this uh, to you know, engage in real dialogue. Uh, so on the first point about why I use the term neologism, that's actually a great point. <laughs> um, I do mention this, I do go into this in the paper um, that in fact, some variation on the complex interrelationship between the ROC and Taiwan was a prominent feature of private and public rhetorical maneuvering of previous political administrations as far back actually as the 1950s. So Chiang Kai-shek in his memoir, or sorry, in his diary, in his private manuscripts, uh, there's a historian Wang Hao who has uh, found that uh, as far back as the 1950s, um, uh, Chiang Kai-shek talked about Taiwan, that they, Taiwan was going to, um, that the ROC was going to provide an outer shell for a project that could only be accomplished in Taiwan. So actually, even Chiang Kai-shek had this uh, kind of, he called it uh, to borrow the shell of the ROC, but it would ultimately have to be whatever political project, it would have to be realized here. So you're absolutely right. Um, this, we could call it a dialectical relationship. We could call it a kind of um, um, uh, discursive, ideological, emotional uh, dance that these two concepts have been making. Uh, for generations here, ROC in Taiwan uh, is, is absolutely uh, uh, an important um, point to make. And um, the reason why I think that Zhonghua Mingguo Taiwan is an important discourse is I would say it's really gained an unprecedented level of official visibility, right? So uh, Ma Ying-jeou very traditionally would just speak of Zhonghua Mingguo. He very clearly said Taiwan was not a guohao, it's not a country. Um, and of course, Li Dang uh, you know, with his passing of the additional articles, with his changing, I mean, amending of the, uh, or additions to the constitution, uh, and made certain moves to think about uh, institutionally how the ROC in Taiwan could uh, coexist. And, and uh, Chen Shui Bian, of course, uh, much more pro Taiwan, much more green. Uh, but I think this Zhonghua Mingguo Taiwan has become really a part of this discourse. You see it in press releases, you see it on her Facebook page, you see it. Uh, in when the Zhao Yubu gives us, <laughs> when we get Gongwen from the Zhao Yubu, uh, I remember uh, I went to LA for a conference um, uh, before the pandemic. And uh, uh, they said, you can say that you're from Taiwan or you can say you're from Zhonghua Mingguo Taiwan. Uh, so this is, this is actually in the official di discourse. So this is to some degree, you know, I think part of, 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 of the rhetorical, um, a, a very visible rhetoric of this administration, but you're absolutely right. It, 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 uh, it's not new in the sense that it does have a long prehistory. Now, I think it is important that she is giving it this, this visibility. Um, and I do uh, think that it is an attempt at coalition building, uh, which was further, um, I think, um, 
on display in her speech at the uh, Zheng Jingguo uh, uh, Museum. Uh, but absolutely, there's a prehistory there. And I just uh, uh, probably should have contextualized it uh, better in my talk. Um, the second point about Xie uh, Xiuhong and Erba, I mean, I'm really, really much more interested in the NCS because this is a, a, a discrete archive of thought of discourse that we actually have um, from this group of intellectuals. So the question of whether Xie Xiuhong was a leader, uh, how much did she lead during the seven days of self-governance? I mean, certainly by late 47, early 48, this, uh, these articles are, are painting her that way. So the legend of Xie Xiuhong is being built up very, very early. But, um, you know, Xie Xiuhong is, is, you're absolutely right to point out. I mean, I mean, she's a legendary figure. There are many, many different ways of interpreting. There's uh, different projects, uh, mainland scholars, uh, Qin Fan Ming's uh, um, appropriation of her to uh, the Taidu cause. Um, you know, she has been appropriated and reappropriated and imagined and reimagined. There's plays, there are novels. Um, she is part of popular lore, part of popular legends. So yeah, the question of, of what, how, how large a leadership role she had uh, to, uh, during the 228, I can't speak to. I mean, I can only, I haven't done the archival work, uh, but I can only go off. My two main sources are Chen Feng and Li Chou But of course, there's many other people who have worked in ARPA. You're absolutely right to say um, there are multiple Arabas. Um, and uh, Zhou Ming and uh, Yang Ke Huang in their memoirs, they talk about how they tried to liaise with other communists on the island. They were also trying to get feedback from the mainland. They were trying to, and at this time, they actually had to send various members of their squad out back to Taipei to try to get some kind of direction. Um, so you're absolutely right. I mean, the communists were there. They were disorganized. It contributed to, I think, the fact that they were only able to sustain power for seven days. Um, but um, certainly, I mean, in Yang Ke Huang and Zhou Ming's memoirs, they, they certainly talk about Xie Xiong as a leader. But you're absolutely right. I mean, was she actually, how much agency she had? I don't know. But I think this is much more, and, and this is, I take this to be an archive of exiled Taiwanese socialist thought. I don't take this to be directly Xie Xiong's own theory. This, we don't know who ultimately wrote these articles. We have pen names, right? Uh, so yes, uh, but you can please. Uh, yeah. you, are, you are talking about the community because you had like the other organization, the, 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 the working committee, right? Yes, yes. So yeah. you had like the two organization and the World War Committee was directly created under the direction of Beijing. Yeah. And uh, and then you had the 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 the, 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 the Yeah. So that's why also like none of them anticipated that. So that was yeah, and even like the, the relation between the two was kind of uh, naturally from that. Absolutely, they had to negotiate. Yeah. I was in Hong Kong. Yeah, uh, that they also had to discuss. Yeah. And what do we do? Because like, like one was directly like by the party, the other one was like by by, by this group. And yeah, so they yeah. kind of overlap and how to coordinate. So absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. There, there, there is a lot of room to actually write the, the history of this little, those like five years of communist movement in Taiwan. I mean, post, uh, post uh, 1930s. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. I mean, this, this is a field that needs good, solid historical research, monographs in French, English, Chinese. Um, so I absolutely agree. So I won't make any claims. Of course, in the presentation today, uh, you know, <laughs> I focused on Xie's leadership role, but how much agency she had during those seven days, that's an open question. The big question I think uh, that uh, um, you want to talk about and that we should talk about, uh, whether, uh, how do we think about the history of Taiwanese nationalism? So I should clarify, um, I would say my position is what I object to is the stripping of colonial era Taiwanese intellectuals of their Sino uh, consciousness. There is no debate that Jiang Weishui was a Chinese, had a Sino consciousness. There are moments where he praises uh, Sun Yat-sen. There are moments in court, in open court, facing imprisonment. He claims that he's a part of the Chinese nation. So, um, of course, people's thoughts are mobile and active, and they are full of dynamism. So, of uh, was there Taidu? Uh, was there independent thoughts or? Thought, how did they think about an independent nation? How did they think about a Taiwan Minzu? 
Uh, can we find discussion of that during the colonial period? Yes, we can. So can you make the claim that there was no uh, Taiwanese nationals at that time? No, but you can make the, all, uh, the opposite claim that there was also Chinese nationals. And the problem with what um, you know, the nativist scholarship does is it robs Taiwanese history of its Sino frame of reference. And when you do that, the, the, the problem of course is, is not only are you not doing justice to Jiang Wei Shui, I mean, not only are you creating a legend that doesn't exist, I mean, it's historiographically, empirically just untrue, but you're also producing an ideology that sees a major figure who has an international conference claim that the colonizers are still with us. I mean, that is ethnic antagonism. And that is, that is you know, this is, these are the wounds that I think at least Zhonghua Mingguo Taiwan are some, some way of, or Yang Lu Bing's work, some way of bringing these two communities together uh, can bring together. So that would be, that, that's my intervention. Now, I can't make the stronger claim that, you know, uh, uh, Taiwanese nationalism does not exist during that time. But I would say what's interesting is you do find that uh, assertion in the 1947, right? That it really becomes, um, it's looked upon as a controlling form. State. So, but I'm sure uh, we can talk more about that. And the integrative justice, that was, uh, thank you very much for bringing that back into the conversation. And as I said, um, I am Paul John Inu. So the term integrative justice is actually not in either of the papers I published. This was a term that I thought about to, to bring to the table today, to, bring, to, to talk uh, with everybody. One of frames of reference for integrative justice, of course, is domestically in Taiwan, working across Waishan, Bensan, and Aboriginal peoples. And we have a lot of work to do, of course, um, in that domestic, uh, uh, and I, I take integrative justice to mean justice in economic terms, in ecological terms, in gender terms, in terms of our daily lives and our labor here. I mean, um, and, and, and facing all kinds of um, I mean, yeah, I mean, we can talk later. We have lots of different interesting, you know, uh, um, struggles that still go on every day. But, um, but absolutely right. When it comes to cross straits integrative justice, I mean, this was a vision of integration. That was shut down by the mainland. It was also shut down by the Kuomintang. In our current impasse, um, if the other side does not recognize your state, which we can still agree is Zhonghua Ming, right? We at least, I mean, well, or Zhonghua Ming will have. Um, it is difficult. It is very difficult. Part of, if we think about uh, for example, Northern Ireland. Let's go back, let's go to a, 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 a peace process that actually worked. There were two major principles at work in the uh, 1998 agreement. One was the principle of recognition. So to recognize the uh, multiple identities in Northern Ireland. The principle of recognition does not exist across the Straits, right? The other side does not ex recognize the, in the, the existence of the ROC as an independent state. So that's a real problem. Second was the principle of nonviolence, which was written into the Good Friday Agreement, uh, that there was not a military or, or, or uh, force-based solution to the troubles, to the Northern Iron Republic. There is also no principle of nonviolence today across the Strait. So the two building blocks of peace are actually not present. Now, how do we get the other side to recognize that is uh, you know, a very difficult question, but you're absolutely right. Um, but I would still, I think we need to challenge ourselves to um, think of creative ways, creative solutions, bring to the table and to say, well, what can you live with? What would a confederated China look like? Uh, what would, because integration can be imagined in ways that are just or unjust, right? An unjust integration is a war. A just integration is some agreement in which you make, which red lines are respected, basic principles of recognition and, and, and non-force, non-violence are respected. And then that provides a, a, a cornerstone for the future, but absolutely. Um, and and um, we need to continue to think about that question. So thank you so much. Uh, let's keep talking. Great, great comments. Great, uh, uh, great questions. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
Um, no, 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 no. I'm saying in the journal, in the journal, it's just in the journal, in this journal, there's very little, uh, if any discussion of, of the presence. I mean, there are discussions of, for example, that Aboriginal people uh, participated in 228 uh, or uh, even in, in certain memoirs of this time, we'll talk about that, but there's no real sustained discussion of what from an Aboriginal perspective would this history be? And how to think it. Uh, I don't think they had a very strong consciousness, but no, uh, not that the entire historical record has a ton of that. No, yeah. uh, but uh, just yes, please, please, please. I, I don't have my passport. I think my passport says a lot. Yes, yeah. My ID yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And just on the first question, um, definitely guilty as charged. I mean, I think I'm probably still thinking like a Westerner. Uh, and I hope to overcome that at some point. But I think the only reason why we need to think about this uh, to face the question uh, is that the status quo might change, right? That's, I mean, if the status quo could just, I mean, for example, in Northern Ireland, right, that agreement was basically let's keep the status quo. But with the with the crucial recognition that we respect each other and that we will not be violent towards another, and 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 the question and the third pillar of that was um, democracy. So any it was written into the agreement that any change in the sovereign status of Northern Ireland had to be agreed to by a plurality of people in Northern Ireland. So um, so they, but essentially with those principles they could just continue to live with each other. And so if, for example, we could just keep the status quo forever across the Straits, well, maybe we don't have to talk about it. We don't have to face the question. The problem is I have no confidence that the status quo will not change. I really do believe Xi Jinping when he says that they want to unify the motherland. Xi Jinping is not someone who is making rhetorical gestures. This is a question, an existential question for them. This is a question that is intimately related to the affective drives that structure uh, their political and 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 uh, um, their political system, and their but but also more deeply their, their emotional and spiritual uh, um, the ways they think about history, the things themselves, their identity. Yeah, but but the, but they may act right. They may act. I have no confidence that they won't. I really don't. I also have no confidence that any external forces may come to Taiwan's help. I also have no confidence that we could, we could withstand any, any kind of serious attempt of, on the island. So the only problem, I mean, I completely agree. We shouldn't have to think about this question. In Canada, except if you are in Quebec, in, Mo in English Canada, nobody sits around thinking about, well, you know, let's, be a, let's think about how we can integrate more successfully with the United States. No, we're clear that these are different countries. Integrative justice in Canada is a question of how Canada 
uh, responds to its heinous uh, historical treatment of First Nations people, right? So it's, an, it's a domestic question, it's not an international question. But here in Taiwan, we just have this, this threat, right? And I guess it, it's a question of, of, your, the, of, the, um, of how seriously we think about this threat, right? If we really believe it, then we have to talk about it. If it really is, if it just is rhetoric, then you know we we can be we can we can you know we can continue with the status quo. But if it really isn't, then that's a huge problem, right? Yeah. 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 Hmm. I mean, not not getting into the problem, but moving forward. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a politician. I'm not understanding. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's a, it's it's a it's a anxiety, right? It's an anxiety that exists. Um, but again, if, if for example, if just if for example some agreement across the straits could be made that just has the principle of recognition and the principle of nonviolence. You would already have a major historical accomplishment, right? So that takes the wutong off the table, takes war off the table. It also says, okay, well, we may have different interpretations of your regime and our regime, but we recognize you, but we both exist. That already would, you know, lessen the tension. But of course the movement is not, is from not, I think this side would be more than happy it's from the other side. So that's a, a, a huge question, yeah. No, no, no. I just have one question. Uh, actually, it kind of echoes the remark of Elizabeth, but maybe it's, it's a question to go one step further instead mm -hmm. of saying, Taiwan, we don't want that, or don't say that, because then it makes it kind of unified. But the way these people think in such a rapid way. But I, I, I was wondering, actually, because these questions are very hard to navigate. I can imagine as a Canadian uh, researcher based in Taiwan, and so yeah. I was kind of wondering if you could tell us more about when you present this kind of content in within Taiwanese academia. What kind of feedback do you have? And if you could tell us a little bit more reflectively, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. sure. When do people actually react? When do people say when 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 you put this thing? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question. Um, I guess uh, one of the one of the uh, important decisions that any researcher has to make is: Do you stand outside of a field, or do you stand within a field? And the field, not just as an academic, but within. If you're studying the history of a society, or if you're studying uh, the literature of a society, if you're studying any aspect of society, are you part of that society, or are you simply? Is it a place you visit? Once a year, twice a year. I think Taiwan, you know, is different when you really believe uh, that no, you live here, your family is here, your future generations will be here. You know, your family, your you know, and when it's not a field, right? It's not a geopolitical, an interesting geopolitical question, right? Uh, it's not some, you know. And I think um, I was talking to Nathaniel uh, about this, you know. Um, before the talk, and you know, I think one of the interesting uh, dynamics of the what we'd say what the global capitalist ac academic marketplace is that um, bilingual, trilingual academics can still really thrive in Asia, right? Because there is this need to to to, to quote unquote internationalize. And of course, internationalization is very problematic because what that really means is anglicization, right? So that's a very problematic thing, but. Um, when you when you say no no this is not just a, a field but this is a place of work a place of a home a place of to really dig and develop roots here and when you think about this as well this you know this could be a future uh wutong right military unification and could you live under that regime and i have many um you know friends in hong kong and I'm sure uh, who are facing exactly that question, right? I mean, I think there was a belief uh, that Hong Kong was really, you know, two, one country, two systems, that it was really outside of the orbit in some fundamental way. And what the security law has done in the events of the past three years is shown that the Chinese state will absorb 
will do anything it can. They have no compunction. They will arrest who they want to arrest. They will clamp down on free speech. They have. They are going to, nay, di hua Hong Kong, right? And they are going to change the fundamental matrix of intellectual cultural life in Hong Kong. And so you, of course, worry, right? So, um, so you know, I do, you know. So the entry point to this conversation is, I think, that right um, is when you do stand not as an outsider, but as someone who uh, you know really does. Uh, live within the society and exist within the society, what responsibility do you have to that society? Um, but you also have a responsibility to listen, right? As you said, you can't say, well, you need to face this, you need to do this, you need to do this, right? Uh, so I do try to listen a lot. I mean, Yang Lubing's work uh, is, is, has been very interesting and we're trying to translate in English, not because I agree with everything he says, but because I think his, his work um, is a balance to Taiwanese nationalism, right? It's a, it's a, it's a different perspective. It's a could maybe get, Sino-Taiwanese perspective. Um, so you play a role as a translator, you play a role to listen, but you also play a role to ask tough questions, right? You really do need to say, look, there are different ways of thinking about this. It doesn't have to be war. It doesn't have to be war, right? The DPP government is making a bet that they won't actually invade. They say they really won't. Or if they do, America will come to our aid. But even if America comes to our aid, the war will be here. It will be our home being bombed. I mean, this is, of course, we're all very cautious of what's happening in, between Russia and Ukraine. So even if America helps, you lose anyways, right? Because you're, you know, so there has to be some way out of this. But as um, um, some members of our audience pointed out, right, it is also incumbent on the other side, right, to think about integration in a, in a nonviolent way. Right, so that's that's a big question. So um, now, what happens when I present this to uh, audiences in Taiwan? I think uh, just this is just a history nobody knows about. I mean, um, like I said, there's a there's a memorial to the battle at Puri, uh, in uh, but it's like completely stripped of its historical content. I mean, it's really just oh, this was about kind of the uh, fight for democracy and and uh, but really the socialist aspects and uh, um, Xi Jinping's involvement with the TCP. None of that is really mentioned. So just I think um, it's a different uh, history that is that is not very well known. Um, and um, and I think it's 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 raw. It's very sensitive. You know, it's not. It's like uh, you know, like the question of when does Taiwanese nationalism start? That's a very, very, you know, complicated question, right? Uh, so when you say, no, 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 Chen Wei Shui was actually a Chinese nationalist, right? That's a, to some people, that's a really difficult conversation to have, right? So, you know, you have to be humble, you have to be, but you also have to be bold enough to ask questions. Um, so it's, it's difficult, but I will say, you know, uh, so Nathaniel, you know, just uh, when we were talking about, you know, what, you know, academic life. I mean, once you root yourself in a place, you have to be responsive to that, that place's um, social and cultural life, right? Uh, even if you are always kind of a ju wai ju nei, you're within the good ju, but you're also without the, outside the good ju, right? Because uh, your symphony is different, right? So, um, so that's kind of more just more personal reflection, more self reflexivity. Um, but um, yeah, it's. I just think the, the the these these sources are not well known, so that's always interesting, right? To see, right? Um, and also, Shea Shui Hong going back to her in the mainland, she's a Chinese nationalist, and for the for nativist scholars here, she's a Taiwanese nationalist. So it's amazing. How can the life of a single person? Well, of course, because there are different moments in her life. There are different documents that we can look at. Even though the, for example, the founding charter of the TCP, the Taiwan Contenda. There's a Chinese copy of it. It's very, it's very easy to find. Uh, um, it talks about, it does talk about the Taiwan Mitsu, it does talk about Taipei, but it also talks about supporting the Chinese revolution and working in concert with the Chinese revolution. Uh, so it's, again, it's this document that has this kind of um, complicated relationship of how it thinks Taiwan and China, right? So uh, yeah, um, I don't know if that answered the question, but <laughs> yeah. Is there another question or is there online? Uh, oh, yeah. 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 Uh, it's actually, uh, her story reminds me of, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the members of the, 
Republic of Oriental Turkestan, uh, mm -hmm. the members of parliament when they went to Beijing in 1950, they crashed mm -hmm. and they died mm -hmm. in Mongolia. So, so for me, your presentation made, uh, made me think about the situation in Xinjiang yeah. at the same point and how Beijing after that tried to cope with uh, you know the, the demand in Xinjiang for the economy. Mm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, there is a story of self governance in China as well. Yeah. At least in the name where Mao in fact gave some region of self governance. Yeah, that is the truth. Yeah. Yeah. He, 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 to, to yeah, yeah, yeah. That is, uh, uh, I, I will, you know, just uh, humbly admit, I think that this is true, uh, need really good scholarship because there has been good scholarship done this. Um, because if you if you read mainland intellectuals on what the concept of zizhi is and the zizhi true, there's often very positive assessments of this experiment, right? And they would even argue that it isn't, it is a federalism of, of, a, of a kind. Um, so, uh, and we all know, of course, that equal dance was originally envisioned for solving the cross-strait issue, right? The idea of equal, but two very distant systems. So, um, but then, of course, uh, you know, how do we think about the success or failure of the Zizi Chu? Um, this is a really important question. Um, one that I uh, will just humbly say that I would let other uh, people have done better, you know, more really rigorous work. But that is absolutely part of this conversation, right? Um, the post-49 development of this concept of zizi within the PRC, what you know, how how did it develop? What was its failures, successes? Um, how does it operate today? Of course, with what uh, we have seen in Xinjiang, uh, and um, um, and their solution was ultimately zizi, right? They very they don't talk about complete duli, right? So um, is that a concept that is at least uh, palatable, right? Um, yeah. So that's like that's a question, absolutely. Do we have any online or okay? Yeah. Um, Maybe we can we can end uh, both here and yeah we'll have any yeah. Absolutely. I'll just I'll just end by thanking everybody for attending. Uh, I talked for a long time, ninety minutes. Um, and also for great questions, great questions because uh, you you know you come all the way up from Kaohsiung or wherever, right? And Sometimes you give talks and then, you know, there's no questions from the audience. <laughs> like, well, why didn't I just, I'll just shouldn't send you the paper, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, these are really complicated questions. So I think they bear more and more discussion. Um, and uh, I look forward to continuing this discussion. So, yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.